We are live. What is up, everybody? Happy uh, Tuesday. Is this in, well, yeah, it's, it's Tuesday. It feels like a Monday, but it's a Tuesday because we had the holiday. Hope you guys enjoyed the nice long weekend. I don't know about you, A.B., but I could do a three-day weekend every single week. Well, here's the question, Spencer. If you had a three-day weekend yeah. every week, mm -hmm. would you rather have every Friday off or every Monday off? I, I don't care. <laughs> do you care? Well... So I think either way, right? Like if you take if you have every Monday off, then it effectively makes Tuesday like a Monday. Okay, then I, right? I'll, ta I'll take Friday. If you take Friday off, it kind of makes Thursday like a Friday. But I think I'd rather have every Monday off because right. I think no matter what, a Friday is going to feel like a Friday. I'll take Friday because it gives, gives me something to look forward to. But I guess I really don't care. <laughs> I've never thought about it before. <laughs> <laughs> These are the things that you think about. <laughs> I guess. All right. <laughs> That's all I was thinking about all weekend. <laughs> we got a lot going on today. We are, of course, going to talk about this Activision Microsoft deal. It is the news of the probably the news of the week, frankly. It could be end up being the deal of the year. Uh, we'll have David Green hop on in a couple minutes. Uh, we have a jam-packed show today. I mentioned David Green. We're going to be talking with Catherine Shen, the co-CFO of Miss Fresh, ticker MF, on uh, 1215. We'll have Matt Hammond talking IPOs at 1230. We're at, at 115, I'm very excited for this guest. Lauren Simmons, she, she is the host of a new show called Going Public. We have um, partnered uh, to, to help them um, get the word out about that show. So we're going to talk about how you can invest in private companies right now that'll be at 115 i'm very excited for that and then at 130 gareth soloway in the money stocks.com will stop by to give us his picks let's run the intro and bring on mr green this is ben zinga live spencer israel and producer a b what's up everybody how are we doing someone told me buy high sell higher let's get mad at on the show talk to my peers jake wajasic from trend spider we have a breaking news All right, it's Tuesday. You know what that means. Time for David Green. Tacos? And tacos. David, do you, do you have any tacos? Taco Tuesday. That's hey, it. You guys, you guys make me laugh all the time. Really. <laughs> what, what day of the week would you rather have off? That's a beautiful yeah, thing. David, I, do you have a preference? Because I don't, I don't care. I don't give a shit, frankly. <laughs> I don't, I don't ever want a day off. I want to trade Monday through Friday, Saturday, Sunday. All right. I don't ever want a day off. Hey. To each his own. <laughs> to each his own. Well, speaking about trading over the weekend, David, I, I don't know if you were watching crypto at all this weekend, but uh, not looking too great on, on the on the Bitcoin Ethereum front. You know, it seems like we're we're kind of stuck at this forty thousand uh, dollar yeah, mark right now. It. Yep. And if we go to our weekly chart, let's go to the weekly. Right. Look at this. So we've been dancing around this weekly chart for what three weeks now. We've been a little above it, a little below it, a little above it. And here we are again. It's let's just call it forty-one thousand, right? The recent low is thirty-nine five, so that becomes a very big level. I'm not saying we're going to twenty-six thousand, but technically that's my next support level. So this this is a big level that we're at right now. I mean, look, if we we can correlate it to the market too, right? The spies right now are exactly testing the lows from what is it last week or the week before? Um, yeah, last week. 456.60. I mean, we're there to the penny, right? And then we're looking. I'm looking if we can look. If we get to our daily level, you're talking about a 10% correction in the spiders. 438.70. I mean, so so back uh, on on Bitcoin real quick. Like, give us some level. Like, where where if it breaks below, would you be worried about it? Uh, you know, going down to. Or, or yeah, on, if, on the upside, like well, what would be the price target if we do get a reversal here at forty thousand? All right, so here's I'll give you both. Look, we're in a downtrend, right, on a weekly chart. Hold on one sec, guys. What are we doing, guys? We're canceling orders for now. Uh, cancel orders for now. Fast market. Fast market. Cancel orders for now. Okay. So my upside, my first target would be forty six thousand. We're in a downtrend. You know, we'd have to get above forty six thousand and 48.6 to reverse the weekly downtrend that we're in and go higher from there. If we break the recent lows of 39.5, I would start to get a little bit worried because my next technical support is around $26,000. Again, I'm not saying it's going there. Uh, you know me, I'm all about technicals, right? So that's it. That's the technicals if it breaks these levels. 
So we'll and I mean, Bitcoin in the coming days. Who knows? It could be days. It could be weeks. It could be minutes. I think I think Bitcoin and crypto in general is is so interesting to talk about these technical levels because in a way it almost becomes a, a like self fulfilling prophecy, right? Because everyone's trading off of these technical levels. Um, because uh, unlike no, you don't buy that. Um, I don't know. I think more people these days are diamond handed uh, Bitcoin and everything else that they're doing rather than trading off technical levels. I mean, from what I see, nobody has ever sold Bitcoin. They buy it and they hold it forever. <laughs> I, yeah, right? Apparently so. I don't see people that are really trading Bitcoin, you know. Um, technically, if we go back to like June, you know, we hit beautiful levels at that 31,000. We got a nice bounce from there. But here we got overbought by any, you know, metrics that we have. And we're sitting at a very important level. But I think more people are buy and hold forever, which is okay. I mean, you know, it probably eventually goes back and makes highs if you believe in the product. But you guys know that's not what we do here, right? David, you, you know what I'm curious for is everyone's buy and hold until you're down 50%. And then they're not – not everyone's so buy and hold. And they, all of a sudden, they're not as convicted as, as they used to be. So we haven't got – we're not anywhere near that, obviously, right now. But I Correct. would be curious to see if we get down to, like, Bitcoin 25K, then – what happens to all the diamond hand holders but uh i guess we'll we'll have to wait and see for them and then for those who are who see me like snickering in the background the reason i was <laughs> snickering is because there's somebody and i'm not going to name names somebody at benzinga who will when you're not at your desk he will go to your computer and he will send messages to other people as you and then he will leave without without a trace Nice. And so someone just sent a bunch of messages from my name to other people. I'm not going to name names, Michael, but um, that's what I, that's why I was snickering. But yeah. um, Anyway, for you guys who uh, can't afford the Bitcoin, the, the, the thing to look at is Bitto, right? Bitto is what follows the, the price of Bitcoin. So, you know, God forbid we got down to that $25,000 level of 26000 I would be buying BITL. Another one we've been talking about for weeks, guys, right? Another uh, buy and hold forever in diamond hand. You know, you go on Tic Tac and every day this stocks goes down and every day there's more people saying, you know, the squeeze is going to be next week. It's going to be next week. It's going to be next week. You know, I've been calling for this stock to go to $10 since it was $70. But let's look technically. We're on a gigantic level right now in AMC. Gigantor. This is a weekly level. It's right there at 1870. And you can see we're sitting right there. I have no, I have nothing below this. This is a gigantic level. If it holds this, maybe you can get a little bounce. If it don't hold this, it's going to where I thought it was $10, $5, whatever, in a certain amount of time. Yeah, for right now, it's holding a weekly level. But that's gigantic. Gigantic. Um, David, have you looked at Microsoft today at all? Yes, Microsoft, Activision. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's a bunch of Roblox trading off this. Mm -hmm. There are a bunch of stocks that I didn't really understand why they, what they were doing based off the Microsoft taking over Activision, right? Is it Activision? I, I, I can explain that, yeah. Uh, I do. There, re there really aren't a lot of many um, public companies in this space. There's like a half dozen or so. Uh, I mean, there are maybe a little more. There's a few more smaller ones, but as far as like – recognizable names you got activision you got ea you got take two you got roblox that's basically it right uh unity sony right uh nintendo these are names that, that are related right to activision um and they're all going to trade off this because this is frankly the biggest deal in the history of the video game space right you have microsoft the owners of xbox um buying uh the largest video game publisher um, in the U.S., uh, it's going to affect the other publishers. It's going to affect EA. It's going to affect Take Two. It's going to affect Sony. You can see Sony today, because Sony's got PlayStation, and PlayStation's top competitor just acquired the owners of like one of the most popular games in the world, Call of Duty. Right. So, um, what does that yeah, mean so for Call? What does that mean for Call of Duty availability on on the PlayStation? We don't really know, um, but that's why you get movement across the whole sector today. Yeah, exactly. And, and again, from a trader's point of view, you know, the ones that we were looking at this morning, EA Sports has had a huge reverse, reversal from the high. Roblox had a huge reversal from the high. So 
you know, I don't think anything is imminent in these things. And from a trader's point of view, they were better shorts than or long. But I get it. There's got to probably has to be more consolidation now for these other ones to keep up with this, right? I would think. I, that's what you would assume. And, and like the other thing is like the buyer is Microsoft. Like what are the implications of that? Because now it's like, okay, so if Microsoft's going to come in here, um, Netflix has made no secret of their of their ambitions for video games. Does Netflix come in? Do they buy someone? Does Apple come in? Does Amazon come in? Like now that like the, the you've opened the doors to the possibility of like a big a major Fang company buying up these publishers, do they all get bought now? Is the question. Take two just bought Zynga for their mobile games. Um, yep. Do I they think all? Facebook was in. Uh... Facebook was in talks to buy Unity. I think that might have fell through. Does it come back now? I mean, yeah, exactly. That's what I'm thinking is because if the idea here is that the the manufacturers of the consoles themselves, Microsoft and Sony, also want yeah uh, the the licensing rights to the games that they're going to have on there might be a, a more kind of like that vertical integration that some of these companies are looking for. I don't know. We'll yeah. see. And then if you pull up the Activision chart, David, you'll see that you know it is it is trending significantly off its takeout price. So yep. it's like takeout price is ninety five, and where are we at right now? Eighty three. Yep. I mean that's a very healthy discount that the market is giving it right now. So, so is that the market saying they're they're doubting if the deal is actually going to go through at that price? That's how I interpret that. That's the, the, how the, I to, interpret it also. To me, that's the market saying, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! Pump the brakes." The, the Department of Justice would like a word with you. Okay. The, the the DOJ would like a word with the, with you. We don't. We're not quite sure about this vertical integration thing. There may be some antitrust concerns. Um, I'm sure Sony's having themselves. Uh, I'm sure Sony's hit, hit, they're hitting the phones hard uh, to all their friends in DC right now. Uh, so and and Nintendo too maybe. Um, yeah, so, I mean, there's a, look. There's always going to be a little discount, right? They're talking 95, so I could see if the stock was hanging around 90. I know. know. 83 90, though somewhere around there look there's a long that like you just said it's gonna be a long time before this deal closes if it closes so, well and they said david they said it, it, it will close next year that's a long right. time I know. <laughs> that's what i'm saying so who knows like you the said, year just the started year. they're saying it's gonna close next, next year anyway that's a very healthy discount i was i'm a little bit surprised but that's the market saying well we're not we're not so sure that the DOJ won't just come in and just say, nope, not going to happen, everyone. Yeah, and what was um, the deal? Which, seven, seven billion? I don't remember exactly. What 70, 70. 70 billion dollars. All right. Yeah. And Microsoft's paying cash, supposedly. If yeah, which to them is like a, you know, a week of earnings, right? You know? Um, exactly. $70 billion as a drop in the bucket. How much cash? Oh, wait, let's look up. How much cash does Microsoft have right now? I bet you they've, here, let's just look in the pro. Take a look. Um, you know, they've like you got. Said, these other companies, Apple, Apple's got a freaking gazillion dollars in cash. Yeah, what's Apple going to do with all that cash? Well, that's been the question for years. Have, yeah, My, exactly. Microsoft has uh, almost seventeen billion dollars in cash. So this is this is a big deal. It wait, is. The, wait, wait, wait. You said they have seventeen billion dollars in cash. Billion. That's in it. in 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 cash, yeah. No, but they just did a seventy billion dollar. Well, they're not going to fund it. They're not going to go. It's not going to come off their balance sheet. They're, you know, they have pretty. They have, they have long term debt. I mean, they, they can take on debt for this deal. It's not going to be a straight. Um, you know, got it. When I hear all money. cash, I think like they've got the cash on yeah, hand. No, too. no, yeah. no, no. I mean, it could, it's all cash, but they have to finance. They, right, they got to so finance they're gonna, somehow. They're gonna, they're gonna take on seventy billion dollars in debt to finance this deal somehow. And just to, because you mentioned Apple, they're known for stockpiling. So Apple has yeah. thirty. Oh, that's less than I thought. Thirty-five billion dollars is less than I, less cash than I thought. Hey, still yeah, thirty-five billion dollars. <laughs> and what's EA's market cap right now? Uh, thirty-six. Apple could just come in and buy, swoop in and buy EA if they wanted to. With just the cash on their balance sheet, not that they yeah. would, but Apple hasn't um, used any of their cash for twenty years. I mean, I, you're right. Know, other than to pay a small, tiny dividend, so yeah, doesn't mean it won't change, you know. But that's it. Microsoft, mean, remember, and, um, Microsoft bought uh, LinkedIn. Microsoft does deals. Um, there was a really good tweet I want to find that had a um, a, a list of Microsoft's deals. Anyway, uh, tell us what you're trading today besides these, uh, David. Yeah, we traded Roblox and a bunch of these things. Um, 
been a good trading day. We've been very, very active. Things have been volatile up, down, and sideways. Yeah, UPST could work for a double top if we get that. Uh, Boeing we've traded today. Set up for a nice trend trade early and then got absolutely crushed. Am I holding SENS? Yes, I am holding SENS. 50 shares. Um, and we added to so far we're in. We added today at 12.50. We sold stock when it got back above 15. So I still have a very small position. And that is a long, long, long-term holding. Um, looking forward to the boot camp to see it. Far from moving out of scan of brand. Um, what else? Myrna, we made a couple of trades today. Oh. Yeah, Myrna, first time it came down here and hit our pivot point. I think we got a dollar out of that trade. It bounced off there. You know, people are telling me, when is Myrna going to stop going down? <laughs> As if David knows. Well, you know, this is what gets people in trouble, right? When you look at a weekly chart and the stock was $500 and it's trading at $189. And I've even yeah. had some people in my room recently that were buying stocks saying, you know, it has to turn up from here. Well, any technician will tell you that you'll go broke before a stock can, is going to stop going down or up because you're in it, right? Here's my technical, guys and girls. 130. That's my technical weekly spot in Myrna, right? That's it. Uh, I know you made a good trade in the QQQs last week there, uh, Mr. Aaron. The TQQQ, right? I did, yeah. Um, I, got I, forgot, I, I guess that was last time. Tuesday. Last Tuesday we had you on. I had those open calls. Uh, I think they were one fit. Well, here, let me see. I can check right now. Well, now they're now they're all different because of the split. But yeah. the seventy six and a half dollar calls I had last uh, Tuesday, and then they had a nice pop the next day. Uh, David texted me Wednesday morning and, and gave me some levels where he said at the time it was one fifty three. This was before the two to one split. He said, "Hey, if it breaks one fifty three, then then you might want to get out of them." Which, uh, I, yeah, I sold them for a nice like sixty percent profit. So not bad oh, move yeah. there. Beautiful, and that was one fifty three. So it was sixty eight times two. So we're at what one thirty six right now, basically. I know we've had a big uh, move down in the last uh, like ten ten percent on, on the Qs in the last week or on TQQQ. Sorry. Yeah, and again, you know, we tested a very big. Actually, we tested it today. This is a daily level in the TQQQ around sixty seven eighty. We're not far from it right now, right? We bounced a little bit above that level. I mean, look, look we're in a little we're in a little downtrend on the no uh, question on the. About it. On the tech, and I mean, it's gonna it's gonna stay in a downtrend until it's not. So whether exactly. that's gonna be a, a catalyst with interest rates or, or or whatnot, but I don't know. I mean, I think it's interesting right now from a macro perspective because I think a lot of these interest rate fears and whatnot were, uh, you know, it's not new news. But with that being said, it's kind of like the, you know the valuations for a lot of these growth companies have been crazy over the last year and a half. So I think this is the market just saying, "Hey, let's get back to some more realistic valuations," um, and then we'll we'll be bullish again. Yeah, Who knows? exactly, exactly. I'm with you. Uh, Tesla, we actually traded today, guys, a couple of times. Before. I didn't even look at Tesla today. How is it doing? I have it's no doing idea. Okay, relatively speaking. I mean, I don't know what it's doing for the day. But let's check. It's flat on the day. Yeah, it's flat on it. Which compared to cents. yeah, that's compared. acting well. But we spiked up to this like 1067 level. And we had a little it's resistance flat, up there. Up. <laughs> yeah, basically, right? Um, we spiked up to this 1067 level. We had resistance up there. We just spiked down to our 65 EMA at 1039, and it went up $8. So as volatile as stock as Tesla is, this one respects levels also, technically. So I have a bunch of people in the room that trade this. Obviously, I don't recommend it for most people because it's extremely uh, volatile, but you just cut your size when you trade it, something like that. What do you guys got? What are you looking at? Hold on one sec, guys. 135.66, uh, what are you talking about? And then last oh, thing, Goldman I, want, today. I wanted to bring up this tweet. Yeah, guys, yeah so. Goldman, Goldman missed this morning, right? You know what, right. though? I'm inclined, it may take a couple of days, David, but I would I would love your thoughts on the banks like on the long side here. I'm inclined. I know they've all just had huge runs, and I, but they do this. This is what they do. They sell off after earnings. This is normal. Um, every, I feel like every quarter is deja vu. So I'd be inclined to look for a level to lean on to buy the dip here. If it were, I, I'd be curious. Wow. To get, to you you guys want to see something wackadoodle? <laughs> Look at that. This is crazy. Goldman Sachs, our weekly level, guys, was $347.08. Right? So you talk about looking for a technical level. 347.08. What was the low today? Let's look. 
347. 347.23. So it basically, yeah. I mean, I, I, I didn't even think to look at this. That was a great spot to enter this stock this morning. And if you entered it, that's your stop order now. So not a lot of risk. You guys in the room see that? Is that sick? Right? You don't, you don't very often see stocks hit, you know, weekly levels. It doesn't happen that often. So, yeah, this was probably a good buying opportunity in Goldman. And you look, if you bought it at 347, it's not much difference if you buy it at 351 in Goldman Sachs. You're talking about 1%. But, you know, that's the line in the sand now. 347, you're in Goldman. If it breaks that, you just get out of it again and look for a lower level. That's it. JP Morgan, let's take a look. That one's been getting a smack of DACA also, right? Yeah, I mean, see, let's, oh. Again, yeah, I, the reason I said I'm not I, I'm not looking today because tomorrow you got Morgan and Bank America, and that'll be that. But um, maybe the back half of the week, I just feel like the banks have been so strong. Um, yeah, I mean, look at J.P. Morgan. We're getting close. So again, I'm going technicals. One forty nine forty. It's a couple of bucks away. That could be one more down day, right? One more down day, and we hit that one forty nine forty. That's a weekly level. I think these are yeah. places again to start these things, right? It's not a place you run in and you, you make your full investment in these things. But if you've been looking to get into the bank stocks and you haven't yet, it's setting up for some good levels, I think, to jump on it. All right. All I right. agree with there you. There we go. There we go. That's what I'm uh, talking about. My thoughts on AMC. Um, <laughs> you guys know my thoughts D on AMC. D David, uh, every... <laughs> Like I get notifications on Twitter, right? And and a lot of it is like when like someone that I follow was like doing like a spaces and like there are people that just talk about AMC. Do you see this too, AB? Like all weekend on yes. spaces. They just talk about this stock and it's like go outside like <laughs> do, do something else there's more to life than amc there like, is and if you go to TikTok, on. tiktok tiktok whatever the hell that thing is there's like 50 people that all they do is talk about amc and i've been talking come about on. it going up since it was 70 dollars, and that's all they talk about and they talk about how it's going to be this squeeze and it's going to a thousand and it's going to blah, 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 blah. please yeah. guys we just hit a gigantic weekly level that if it holds, it might rally a couple of points. That was $18.60. That's where we are. Look at our weekly chart, guys. I've been saying we're going to hit this level for weeks, and there it is. We hit it. Uh, yeah, honestly. Here. You want to be long Sony's... AMC? Be long right now and have an $18 stop. If it breaks 18 it's probably going to 10 and then to 5 That's my thoughts about AMC. Ahead, Wait, let's say that. Let's say that one more time. If you if you want to be long AMC, you said get in now with an eighteen dollar stock or that's stop. That's, that's not bad. That's a fi that's fifty right. cents of risk. That's not bad. That's not. That's it. Because if it cannot hold a gigantic weekly level, then it's all over. I have nothing else technically, and technically speaking, the stock. Again, my opinion, the stock isn't worth anything. Okay, sure. nobody was going to movies before the pandemic, and they were going out of business. They have six point five billion dollars in debt. They have trouble. They're gonna have trouble raising money to pay that debt. They're gonna do a secondary again at some point, which people who don't know what they're talking about think that's good. It's really not, but they're gonna have to do that to raise money to pay off some of their debt or restructure or something else. Anyway, that's my thoughts on AMC. You want well, you can long, always spend. You you can always spend out. something in your favor, right, David? So if you're if you're long, then doing a second offering is good. If you're short, then doing a second offering is bad. Yeah, and plus you had you know the CEO and nine other True. insiders doing nothing but selling stock for the last six months. Yeah, which apparently the Adam Aaron's done selling now. He's finished selling. So he, he says. says. So he says. So he we'll says. See. We'll see. We'll see. I, I love. Him. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I I don't know how some of these uh, influencers, you know, if you want to call them on TikTok, YouTube, whatever, have been talking about the same stock for seven months. I'd go crazy. Come on, guys. There's yeah, and five. There's also, there's. How many thousands of stocks out there we can trade? About 10,000? They, 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 <laughs> About they eight. Last, when they announced their last secondary, I think the stock was 60, and they priced it at 34. And it went to 34, and that's when they did the last secondary. So if they mm. do another secondary here, where's the stock going to go? Well, yeah, let's check in on, uh, I don't know if you've seen this at all today, David, DWEC. Yes. Another How's it, stock How's it doing today? I'm very today. good to What do you think, today? Spencer, red or green? Uh, probably ah. green. It's probably green. Yes. It's up 15%. Yeah. 
Yep. Really? Yeah. Why? <laughs> 80 bucks a share. Why? why? Who knows? Who why? knows no, why? No, 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 but like there might actually be like a headline. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. I'm, I'm genuinely let's, curious. Let's talk about that for a minute, guys and girls, okay? Because maybe there is a headline, and maybe when any stock does any. Obviously, stocks move sometimes because of headlines, right? To us as a trader, I could give two shits, pardon my language. This is set up for about five great trades today in DWAC. I don't care if it's trading at $25 or $80. And people ask me today, mm. Dave, is this going to go to 100 mm. I don't know. If you think something's going to go to 100 you buy options in it. So you can't lose a lot of money, right? But this technically for us again today, guys, and by the way, they took the short away from us. Second day in a row, this stock was available to short for us forever. Now nobody has Ooh. the shares. Nobody has the shares. That's why it's trading higher. That's one of the reasons you, it's trading high. Yes. You can't find, you can't locate shares to short. What is the damn float on this thing? It's probably like 10 million. Um, this is another one, you know, that whatever. There, I don't I, I anyway. don't think it's worth whatever. Who cares? It's here, Here's the bottom line, guys. The stock is worth what people are willing to pay for it, right? So AMC was worth $72 a year ago because that's what people are willing to pay for it. Now it's worth $18 because... Nobody thinks it should be trading at $72. But again, you know, technical, technical, technicals. We sit here, guys, and I'll talk long-term stuff with anybody who wants it. I do all the time with the people in my room. But when we walk in on a day like this, we've had guys in the room. How many trades today? I think we had five or six trades today. We've made money on five or six trades. And then look, we don't make money on every single trade. Nobody does. But it's all about technical analysis, even with these stocks. This DWAC made a high of 84. It pulled back to our trend at $78. So it went down $6 and hit a spot where it told us to buy the stock, and it's up $3. So that's um, what we look for. Th there was a question in the chat uh, about SoFi. David uh, trades – David is long-term bullish, but he trades around his bullish position all, like, all the damn time. I, I, I don't do that. Um, I'll, I'll say on SoFi, like – I am long until one of two things happens. Well, actually, basically until one thing happens. Um, until well, no, I guess it's two things. Until either, you know, my my horizon plays out. In this case, I've got like a, you know, a couple year time horizon on this thing. Um, so you know, if it's twenty, if it's the year twenty twenty four, and so far is out of fifteen, then it's probably time to reassess for me. Or number two, if the fundamental thesis changes, which I i.e. would be the bank charter if they do not get a bank charter then the thesis is changed and i probably have to sell right at a loss but until that happens i ain't doing not i'm doing nothing right now david trades around his position all the time he can give you some short-term levels but i am i am bullish until one of those two things happens either a my time horizon that i have for a couple of years you know expires or b the fundamental thesis of the company changes at this point it's tied to their ability to get a bank charter if they get that charter I'm great, I'm bullish. I'm in it. If they don't, then time to reassess. That's my um, take. I, I, that's my take on the long-term stock, also. Yes, but us as a trade, right? We had a tiny position coming in today, and yep. today we added again at twelve fifty. But our original position in this was fourteen. We sold it at twenty-two and twenty-three when I told Spencer to sell all this. Um, but that's <laughs> yeah, a different story. Did. Our yeah. original position was fourteen dollars, right? And actually, I was in on the IPO for nine dollars, but. For my room and everybody else, we got in at $14. We sold it between 21 and 23. We bought stock back at 15. We sold it above 16. We bought stock back at 14. We sold it above 15. So I have a tiny, tiny position that we added to today at 1250. And I, you see, I'm long 40 shares of the stock. Okay. And my average is 1313. So that's where we're at right now. I have the same long term thesis as, uh, as Spence does. I'll add, you know, at $12, $1150, $11. Keep it very, very small until I think it's a time to size up, yeah. either from a technical level or a news level. And that's it. We're hanging out with it. <laughs> Shelly, I have a mental timeline. Everything is mental. I don't write things down. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, I'm not organized like that. A everything is vaguely in my head. <laughs> that's a beautiful thing. That's like, that's like trading and having a mental stop. <laughs> no, hold on. It doesn't Look. work. There's a time and a place. There is a time and a place, okay? There's a time and a place. I'm with you. All right. UPST is a lot of, another one a lot of people are asking a bit about long term, right? I have another uh and look what this stock has done. It's sick, right? 
We came close. We went from four hundred dollars. Our long term price target was about ninety seven, which we didn't actually miss by much. I think UPST is a good company too. I mean, I don't think it should have been four hundred dollars. Maybe it shouldn't be a hundred dollars. It probably should be somewhere in the middle. But we were looking for technical level to buy it, and it didn't quite get there. So, guys, you just get a shortness. See, someone in my room posted the shortness at fifteen twenty. 115.20, and it just went down a dollar thirty. Nice job, Melissa. So again, technicals, guys, right? The stock went from 110 to 115, and we had a pivot point telling us to short the stock there for a day trade. It just hit 115 and went down a dollar fifty in about 35 seconds. So another beautiful trade that we had. Good job, Melissa. We have uh, I don't know what do we have? 90 people in the room, and we're all sharing and posting all day long, and having a good time. DWAC. All right. We're breaking down now. DWAC. Right. So what do we got guys? Yeah. Got to love the VWAP guys. 7880. So this is what we do all day, guys and girls. We hang around, we talk, we have a good time and we put trades in when our charts tell us to trade. 7880. So you'll see, I'll put an order in and DWAC at 7880. I'll be aggressive down there because I kind of like that. We'll put a hundred shares out at 7880. That is our VWAP telling us to buy the stock. Spies are dumping. Man, they're not dumping. They're kind of just hanging out again. Uh, yeah, dumping is a strong word. <laughs> I don't know. But it's you know, easy to everything dumps or rips when you're on the one minute chart. Get, get well, off the one minute. Yeah, we're always on a five minute to start, but <clears throat> we never look at a one minute to trade unless we're going to get a far from moving average trade or something. But the point was. You always look to see what the overall market is doing before you put any orders in. Yeah. Because, the, you know, you might want to back off if the market's really coming in strong. So you always look, right? All right. David Green joins us every single Tuesday. Uh, guys, uh, check out the link to his uh, trading course. It is in the description. I will put it in the chat right now. It is called Wall Street Global Trading Academy. Here, let me, I'll just put it on the screen for you. How about that? Yeah. You Wall think, Street um, Global trading academy where is let's get that link wstga by the way we've shortened it oh really yeah. everyone loves Wall a good Street. acronym wsgta.com boom also guys we have our boot camp next week um but anyone who wants to come visit for the next four days four days four days this week shoot me an email at dgreen927 at yahoo.com so you're out next week right david uh, I don't know. I think I'd like to. I'd like to come in on Tuesday, and we'll show yeah, you guys you a little know. bit about what we're doing. Now let's okay. let's say let's say we're going to be here. Okay. All right. Let us know. Okay. Anyway. If anyone wants to come in, degree nine two seven at yahoo dot com. Send me an email right now, and I'll pop you into the room. And thank you guys for having me. And we have the boot camp this week. Oh, good for you, Cheryl. Excellent. All right, David. Have Thanks, a good David. One. Always a pleasure. Be, be good. Everyone. Stay green. Yes, always a pleasure, guys. He's always green. <laughs> hey, it's his last name. That was a joke. Yep. All right. Just good, like my shirt. Good teamwork. Uh, I wore red today because when I woke up, I saw a bunch of tweets about how the market was down, and that's why I wore this shirt. True story. Really? True story. Yeah. I wore green because I'm. I was trying to will the the ah. indices back to the green. A uh, couple things we got to talk about, Spencer. So the first one is that we need more likes. We do need That's more. That's the likes. first thing. We got to see. Did you see? So Stephen A. Smith just did a segment on ESPN. Okay. Where all it was was him putting up pictures of crying Cowboys fans and him laughing at them. Okay. <laughs> I mean, we can start doing that too. Well, to be fair, okay. I and again, I, I see both sides of this, right? I try to be a realist. I try to stay middle ground. I try to always understand both sides. Seek to understand, right? Okay. On one side, what's it to understand? Kind of an easy target, Cowboys fans. Like I almost kind of feel bad for them, right? Crying at the game. On the other side, come on. Stephen A has to deal with like Skip, or he had to deal with Skip Bayless being the most obnoxious Cowboys fan ever, and that says a lot because Cowboy fans in general uh, can be a little obnoxious. So uh, at the end of the day, I don't feel too bad. Yeah, no, 
<laughs> but I see both sides. I'll say I, that. I, I definitely do not feel bad. Uh, um, but uh, the, the, that wasn't the couple things that we need to talk about. Spencer, yeah. you're right. We do need more likes. We've got some great interviews, some great guests oh, yeah. coming up. Um, but we're not going to be able to get to them if we don't get enough likes. So please smash the likes so we can continue with the rest of the show. Uh, like Spencer mentioned, we've got Catherine Chen, CEO of Miss Fresh, coming on at 1215. Matt Hammond to talk about some IPOs at 1230. Uh, Lauren Simmons from Going Public at 115. I'm really excited about that, Spencer. Lauren, you know, she was the uh, youngest female full-time trader on the New York Stock Exchange. I, I I knew that because I saw her Wikipedia page. So, yes, I did know this. Okay. Um, but Either way, she's very impressive. Yeah. I mean. Total baller. She's, what, I'm 20, turning 25. She's 27. She's got her own Wikipedia page. <laughs> I, mean, I, I hope. Total baller. I hope to have my own Wikipedia page by uh 27 if uh anyone out there is a big wikipedia person they want to make me one let me know i'll send you some, I, I, i'll send you some info I, i'm gonna piggyback off of that if somebody is active on wikipedia and they want to just like add me give me my own page no, i asked first i know i'm piggybacking okay I, I'm, I'm not gonna say Dude, spencer a second do you want to share one no all right i'm just trying to make it less well, we more. can both be on we can be on the benzinga live wikipedia page together all right i'm just just throwing out ideas just the spitball and see Easy Mike there. says uh, his son loves her. How did uh, how did you guys first get introduced to Lauren Easy Mike? I'm curious. Um, but all right, a couple other news items. We mentioned the Activision Blizzard deal uh, mm-hmm. with with David. But the biggest question out there for gamers right now is what does this mean for Call of Duty? Right, because we've seen Microsoft in the past. Uh, go out if, if you're for, if you're a gamer if you're familiar with gaming you know that Halo and the Halo franchise is an Xbox exclusive, but that wasn't always the case. So Bungie makes Halo, and there was a time where Bungie was completely independent and Halo was available on PlayStation and Xbox. Uh, Microsoft essentially went out and saw the value and how just obsessed people were with the Halo franchise. And uh, I don't know if they outright purchased Bungie or if they uh, just worked out a deal with them to essentially exclusively hold the rights uh, for Halo games. I I'm, I just tried to Google, when did that happen? Do you do you know when... The Bungie? Well, it happened in between Halo 2 and Halo 3. Okay, that answers the question. So right. Halo 2 was available on both consoles. Oh. Halo 3 uh, only available on xbox and microsoft i mean this must have worked out nicely for microsoft the halo deal because uh they're doing it again now with activision so for anyone and like myself i play call of duty on playstation i don't know what this means for me in the you future i need to invest in an xbox i'm stuck in this limbo <laughs> well okay so this is what i wanted to talk about spencer because there are yeah. a number of different options here right a microsoft leaves um leaves Call of Duty on, on PlayStation and Microsoft, and, and then boy, is it also on Nintendo? You, you might no. as well throw. It's no, not, it's not, it's not no. On the, Nintendo only has like Nintendo games. Really? I didn't know. Not that. only, but like I don't think so. Mostly. Okay, fine, whatever. PlayStation. Moving on. No, that's not right because they have like EA. I don't know. I don't think I don't think Call of Duty is on Nintendo at okay, all. Okay, fine. PlayStation. Moving on. I'm just talking about PlayStation fine, fine. and Xbox. Fine. So. Option A, Microsoft leaves Call of Duty on PlayStation and Microsoft and gets, full games. And gets paid by Sony. Warzone and gets paid by Sony every time someone buys uh, a copy yep. of, uh, of Call of Duty on PlayStation. Option two, Microsoft uh, you, you know, does what they did with Halo, and they go, they go exclusive on Xbox for Call of Duty. Uh, I don't think this is going to happen, but that is an option out there for Microsoft now. Option three. Kind of a hybrid. They take the the Call of Duty what would games. That, what would that look like? So that so they take a a call like the, the Call of Duty games like Vanguard. Every time Call of Duty puts a new actual sixty seventy dollar game out there, you can only get it on Microsoft. But they leave Call of Duty Warzone, which is the free to play version, kind of the Fortnite of Call of Duty on both. Because having that free to play game, I mean, if they take Warzone off of PlayStation and other and PC, then right away it kills Warzone. The whole the whole benefit of Warzone is the fact that it's free to play and I can play with my friends that are on computer on Xbox. Um, okay. So I could foresee either option A or C, not really B, but that could come that could come as a surprise. Well, the, for option C for the hybrid approach, Sony would have to agree to that. Yes. For which one? For the hybrid approach. 
So what's the stop? Well, Sony's they're gonna in- they're not gonna agree. I mean, Sony's agreement would say like, okay, we'll keep Warzone on. They wouldn't want to get rid of Warzone. I wouldn't think. Right. If all the value was in Warzone, which is basically what you just said, right? They, if all the value is in Warzone, and then losing that would defeat the whole purpose. I don't think all the value is in Warzone, but I right. think Microsoft would have something to gain even if they wanted to make the actual games of Call of Duty exclusive by keeping Warzone on uh, PlayStation and other platforms. Because like I said, if they take that off of PlayStation and make it Xbox exclusive, then it effectively kind of kills the game. Right. And right now Warzone is one of the most popular uh, online multiplayer games in the world. Right. Yeah. Okay. I, I, either way, like Sony is not going to go down quietly not not going down going down is a strong it's not the right way to put it but sony's not going to be quiet here they i'm sure have been on the phone um today to their lobbyist friends in dc at the doj saying this is this is ridiculous oh they have no antitrust argument here I wouldn't say they have no argument. You say they have no argument? Well, I mean, what? You look at Activision's... I mean, why is... Look at Activision's market share of the video game overall. It's probably less than 10%. Sure, that's that's the Activision argument. The Sony argument is that there are only two... There are only two major uh, uh, gaming platforms in the world. I guess you can count three, count Nintendo. but uh, So there are three major gaming platforms in the world, and you're basically taking one of the top titles off of two of them. I, I don't know. I don't know. No, but they're not taking the titles off. That hasn't been, you know. Yeah, no, 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 you're right. They potentially could, though. That's on the table. So, right. yeah. But again, I think if you look at the actual numbers as far as what does Call of Duty make up of the total uh, market share in terms of actual games, it would if, be if small. You take it, if you t- even if, I think even if you look at the market share of Xbox, uh, Xboxes, um, and PlayStations, in terms of overall gaming now, uh, I mean, mobile gaming, I think it's way bigger. You, right, you have, you have the Switch, you have mobile yeah, sure. gaming, you sure, have sure. the Oculus. I don't even know if, if Xbox and PlayStation together make up the majority of, of gaming market. That, w- that is what our activism will argue. I will say this, there will be lawyers. Can we agree on that? There will be lawyers um, here. Sony is, is lawyering the F up because um, they, they don't want option B. They don't want the exclusivity from uh, you know on on Xbox here. So, um, active. You you've got a good point. I mean, the market is large. COD is a small slice of that market. Um, but anytime you talk vertical integration, uh, especially in this climate, right? Think about all the regulatory stuff happening in the realm of big tech, right? Apple, Facebook, Google, uh, Amazon. And and now Microsoft too. These are these are companies that are in the crosshairs of the FTC of the DOJ. Um, I don't think the regulators will go away quietly on this. So that's probably why they're pricing in a larger a, lar- a larger spread between the takeout price and, and the price it's trading at today. But Sony is down. How is Nintendo doing today? Let's look at that stock. It doesn't trade super actively in the U.S., but it does trade a little bit. Yeah, there's no volume. This thing trades. Hunt a couple hundred thousand shares a day, uh, but it's actually up one and a half percent. That's interesting. Hmm. I don't know. I just think like assuming the deal will go through is is exactly that. It's an it's an assumption. I don't know if we can assume that just yet. Regardless, huge freaking deal today, right? I mean, I want to show this tweet that I that I had from uh, our old buddy John Ehrlichman, uh, who's been on the show before. And um, it's a it's a list of the biggest deals. Oh, gotta get, I got to get him back on. It's a list of the biggest deals in Microsoft's history. Look at where today's deal stacks up. I remember the LinkedIn deal. Everyone everyone laughed at that. I, I guess it remains to be seen how um, if that has worked out for them. I don't really know. Uh, but this is the biggest deal in in Microsoft's history. So it's a big deal. The biggest deal in gaming history. Like I said to my friends earlier, if you are, and. This applies to Aaron. If you are a PlayStation gamer that plays COD, maybe think of a little bit about investing in an Xbox. Wait, there on Thursday, there was a block trade for 980,000 shares of, it, of uh, Activision. You can do this for every deal ever. 
There are always block trades all day, every day. Like there that, are always big options. Somebody's always buying call options. You think options. that could just be like a quant or like someone just got lucky and bought 980,000 shares of... I am not that... It's always possible. I think if you are that dumb, though... <laughs> like that's a good point all right that's your best that's your best refute to the conspiracy is that you'd have to be really really be so fucking dumb to go out and buy nine hundred and eighty thousand shares two days before the deal goes through you would have to be so dumb to do um that. but yeah <laughs> and, and also to be fair i mean it was at 64 17 you look at activision's chart you can just argue that like wow that was way below the you know moving average of the you know for most of the year Activision has been trading in between ninety and a hundred dollars, so the fact yeah. to buy it at sixty bucks or whatever is is not bad. Dude, the biggest takeaway that I have today is congratulations if you bought Activision last summer and you and it sucked for you. I mean, so Spencer, on a deal uh, like this, where yeah. right now we talked about how Activision is still trading below the price, where if the deal goes through, uh, it, it's, yeah. it's supposed to go up to what ninety five. Ninety, yeah, ninety five is the take is the price. When when is like how quickly do these things usually either fall through or get pushed through? Well, they said they're not going to close the deal until next year. That's already a long time. Right, we're talking at least twelve months. Um, I think Slack Salesforce took like a year also. That one took a while. Um, obviously, AMD Arm has taken quite a while because there's hurdles over there in Europe. Um, I don't know the answer to your question. It really it's it's up to the companies to provide us updates on how that process is going. The longer it takes, the more inclined the market is to think something uh, something might be fishy. But um, I, I don't really know to answer your question. They already gave us a timeline of one year, so that's what we have to go off of. Um, but if I were an ATV, I, I would sell. Forget the last $13. I would, I would get out. This, this is it. Unless the only other thing – that would give you some serious regret is if somebody else if is if Netflix came out and we're like we're buying them for a hundred million dollars, which like who the hell knows if that's that'd be happen. a great deal considering uh, you know Microsoft was willing to pay seventy billion so if they I, got them for a hundred million I, yeah who the hell knows I'm just throwing that out there that would be the only thing. But if it were me, if it were me, and I was an ATV, real quick, because it is time to get to our, our first guest, yes, it uh, is. Catherine Chen. Uh, just give me two seconds. Easy Mike was asking for other takeover targets in the space. Well, now it's every now everything everyone's on the table, right? Everyone. Every, every take two, uh, Sony could go out and buy take two. Sony could go out and buy EA. Someone could go buy Unity. Someone could go buy Roblox. So literally every, yep. uh, you know, all the Fang stocks that have the market cap to be able to purchase some of these game companies. I don't know if there's a, a single one. Maybe Roblox or Unity might be too big at this point. Um, we got a stock today from Michael Pactor. If you missed him, he was he's a uh, video game analyst at Wedbush. He was on pre market prep today, and he gave us a. I mean, yeah, um, Unity is thirty five billion. Um, he he gave us a smaller name, PLTK, Playtika. Let's bring up the chart, and then I'll, and then we have to get to our guest. So we're, we're doing that. But uh, there, here's Play Tika today. Oh, it gave back all those gains. Mm, interesting. Smaller name. To Aaron's point, everyone's on the table. As soon as you say the Fang stocks are on are are hopping in the pool, every company is on the table. EA, Take Two, all of them. Maybe even Sony. Heck, you know. So that's why today's deal is so big. All right, we got to go to our guest. We're running a few minutes behind schedule. So let's bring our first guest of the day on the show here. Uh, I'm going to bring up uh, the chart. There we go. All right, we're talking. Uh, we're going to pivot from video games to uh, retail. This next company has a pretty interesting model. We're talking to Catherine Chen. She's the co-CFO of Miss Fresh. There is a chart up on the screen. And uh, let's bring Catherine Chen on the show. Here she is. Catherine, how are we doing today? Oh, your, your microphone's on mute. Can we un unmute yourself there on the uh, on the stream? You're on the bottom of the page. And we lost her. <laughs> what did... Uh, That's okay. We'll what get did uh, Inskeep from uh, NPR says something when... when she's Trump back. Okay. She, she's she, back. We got she, her back. She's back. She hit the wrong button. That's okay. It happens. Hey, Catherine. Hi. How are we doing? Hi, everyone. Hi, Spencer. And AB. How's it going? <laughs> Great. How's, how's your Tuesday? 
Oh, it has been a great day. A great day. I'm ha I'm so happy to hear that. Well, uh, I, where are you joining us from, Catherine? I'm joining you from Beijing, so it's midnight here, so it might look a little bit dark here. Yeah. Wow. Oh well, well, thank you for joining us so late. It's great to have you on the show. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, uh, we appreciate that. So, okay, the reason uh, uh, we had you on here today is Miss Fresh actually had a, a headline. Was it last week now, or was it two weeks ago? I don't even remember anymore. I think it was two weeks ago. Uh, you announced that you had signed uh, deals with over twenty uh, regional chains uh, in China to use uh, your platform. Maybe you can just explain what exactly the platform is and your business model, and then we'll get into you know that headline from the other week. Okay, sure. So Miss Fresh, we are the first one who created distributed mini warehouse model in China. So it's more like uh, you could see that the GoPath model in US and also the Amazon Fresh model in US that we have already covered 17 first tier and second tier cities in China, uh, serving the, the, the top tier cities of customers that we are providing like a 30 minutes delivery of grocery and fresh produce uh, to, uh, to our customers home. So it's kind of an instant like online on demand retail business we are running from year 2015. And later on, we have accumulated a strong platform that using algorithm and AI driving this kind of long term business, then we're, we're able to uh, enlarge this platform and empower a wider segment of the business, including like the local, like a supermarkets, and also local wet markets, fresh market, that's using our technology platform to get more digitalized. So this is what we have been doing since 2015. And we are changing from an online like retail company, on-demand retail company, uh, uh, gradually that we have a three, per, uh, three, three legs of the business. And we also have a, uh, like a SaaS plus AI empowered technology platform, which is our retail cloud business that you mentioned, which is like signing up over 20 like uh, 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 customers, uh, 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 regional uh, supermarkets as our customers to use our technology and solutions to get them like online, get them digitalized, especially right. after the uh, COVID pandemic. So wait, for so this wait. kind of business, that, that we also like collaborate with Tencent, which is uh, one of our shareholders to get like uh, involved in the big like digitalization trend with the overall like neighborhood uh, retail industry. Wait, so what is the distributed mini warehouse model? Do we have an equivalent in the US like that? Yes, for distributed mini warehouse model, the, the, the most like uh, benchmark one is called GoPuff. Go Puff. G O P U F F, where okay. like you stay at home, you order from a mini warehouse near your community, then you can re uh, you can receive your fresh produce and grocery around thirty minutes time. So this is something we do, and we have already built up our mini warehouse network covering seventeen like first tier and second tier cities in China. So, so okay, th that makes sense. I, I, in what is the what is the market for like delivery like that in China? Because like in the U.S., we we have that market. It exists. It's definitely in its early stages, though. I, I probably the vast majority of people do not get grocery deliveries. Um, wh how is, is how is that in, in in China? So in China, actually, it's it's a, a relatively like. A, uh, developed market given our okay. efforts in the past like uh, uh, six to seven years. So basically, like especially after the COVID pandemic, people are used to order their grocery at home. Then they wait uh, for the for grocery to arrive their doorstep. Then they, they will cook at home. So this is how people like uh, now like shopping in China, especially for like uh, younger generations of uh, consumers, they no longer use to go to like a wet market or supermarket to shop for grocery. They rather like order online as it is so fast and they don't need to do all the like product picking that we are doing that for them. And we also do like direct sourcing from the origins that to make sure our product are are highly selected and with very good quality. So this is something like a, a, a trend that actually the, the Chinese consumers are doing. And we see there's a like, uh, there's also like, a, uh, there's also some of the statistics showing that people are more and more of the people are used to uh, this time, uh, this, uh, this, this way of uh, grocery shopping. 
So the grocery business is known as one that is very low margin, right? Um, obviously, mm -hmm. it's different if you have a physical storefront uh, and you don't have that. Um, but what are your margins like? So in, in terms of the margins, so uh, for our like uh, instant delivery, so this kind of like products you offer a, a, a service that you combine like delivery to home. So people are actually willing to pay for a premium uh, compared to a supermarket. For now, our uh, uh, in third quarter, our gross margin is around like 13%, 20.3%. Uh, over 12 percent but in the long run that the unit economic model is to be the gp margin will be over like a 20 to 25 percent range along that and then like with a a, a more like a, a reduced like a delivery and fulfillment expenses that the company will re realize like a long term like a net margin around th three to five percent so that's more closer to like uh uh this is a a, a a ue model that we're looking for this kind of business and there's an increasing trend that the consumers new generation of consumers are willing to pay for fulfillment where uh we we see that people are willing to pay for a, 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 a fast delivery fee. So in that case that we can also have a more space to improve the long-term like net margin perspective. And with the, the, the uh, comparison model, like in US, like Amazon Fresh and, uh, and GoPuff, actually uh, they, have a, a, a rather, uh, they have already demonstrated a good model of uh, uh, receiving, uh, uh, having like a more premium like GP margin uh, compared to a numerous normal supermarket and right. also having like a, a, a good like charge of the delivery fee. And this is a good question from the chat. In terms of the warehouses, I mean, are those automated that they run by robots obviously you have to get the delivery out somehow so i assume that you have drivers there but how, how does that whole thing work so um for, for our like uh, uh distributing mini warehouse like this kind of mini warehouse are operated by ourselves and we have riders and uh, also picker packers in it. And then like uh, for the riders, uh, it's uh, uh, basically the riders are uh, most, 90% of the riders are, are our own like uh, 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 riders that they will deliver uh, directly from this kind of mini warehouse to people's home. So due to our strong technology platform, we are able to use algorithm to optimize the routes. So each time from the mini warehouse to the customer home that they can deliver six to eight packs per, per ride so basically it help us to mitigate uh their their like uh their their routes efficiency so on average a rider can deliver uh, around like 50 to 80 like packs per day so which is of very high like efficiency uh compared to like uh uh, uh, compared to uh, like a meal delivery platform, and in terms of the 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 the, the drivers, so uh, because um you you might see for our riders from the mini warehouse to the customer home, it, they are on like uh, the 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 motorbikes, and then for for the like long term like long distance like line haul transportation from the origin to our big warehouse and from the big warehouse to the uh, smaller like mini warehouse is it, done by like third party logistic companies that we collaborate mm -hmm. with uh, also help us to uh, to provide a good operational efficiency. All right, Catherine Chen, the co-CFO of Miss Fresh, joining us. We know it's very late, so we appreciate you hanging out with us uh, way past your bedtime, I presume. Uh, so thanks a lot for coming on today, Catherine. Thank you. All righty. Um, and that, that was Catherine Chan, the co-CFO of Miss Fresh, ticker MF on the screen there. Um, let's take stock of things here. Let's do a real fast crypto update before we bring on our next guest. I can even find my video. Oh, where's my heat map? My heat map is, uh, there it is. Bring the crypto heat map up on the screen, and it's looking like somebody that. called Moses because this is a Red Sea. Oh, where's the, uh, where's the, where's the drums? Right here. That ain't it. Our soundboard ain't work. Oh. <laughs> what did you just do? I don't know. Anyway, sh wait. Should I? Do I need to refresh this? I, I assume it's up to date but I haven't refreshed it for a hot second, so let's just do a quick refresh here, but I'm 
95 percent sure that's up to date anyway bitcoin down one percent everything down even near oh near protocol uh yeah it's up to date near protocol down 4.7 percent still love you near don't own it don't own it don't know what it is but it, it's still up like 100 percent it's up 90 percent in the last 30 days uh so there you go down day that's the way it goes sometimes in crypto land what are you gonna do yeah anyway Wait, real quick before we, we yeah. get to matt hammond What's i don't up? know if you've already seen this headline i know i haven't uh they're making a biopic about weird al yankovic yeah oh, actually i did actually did see that oh so yeah. you saw who's playing him yeah daniel radcliffe i know big I fan i was gonna ask if uh is it I, I was gonna have you guess and i would have like guessed a million people before Daniel Ratcliffe to play Weird Al Yankovic, I think. Is it biopic or biopic? I've always called it biopic. Biopic. It's biopic? Well, it's bio I, I see it as biography picture. Biopic, right? So, yes. Your your way makes sense, but my way seems like just I natural. think biopic is a, is a word, but it has a different meaning. I don't think so. You don't think so? I don't know. Let's get a survey going on the chat. And hey, in the meantime, if you guys want some free crypto, you know what to do. You download the Voyager app. You use the offer code Zing, Z-I-N-G. You fund your account with 100 bucks. You make a trade, any trade, and they will send you $50 in Bitcoin for free. Check it out. Uh, survey in the chat. Is it biopic or biopic? Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll figure it out. The <laughs> other thing, Spencer, uh, again, we got Matt Hammond coming on, so I'll make this quick. But... Yeah. Um, I was laying in bed last night and I couldn't sleep, mm -hmm. and I uh, I didn't even like realize it, but I, I pulled up Wordle on my phone and started playing. But I was doing it at like twelve oh five a.m., so oh, it was like five minutes into the fresh one. And you got the days. And I got today's, so I've already done it. But I, then like, and then I was going through my like routine of of when I can't sleep. So then I was going to like Twitter and going through like mm -hmm. all my social media apps. Mm -hmm. Um, and there were a bunch of people on Twitter, like posting their, you know how people post like the squares of like what mm -hmm. they guessed on Twitter at mm -hmm. like 1205. Like people were like waiting up for 12 for the new word. Or wait, do it. Did, did today's word start with a P? Cause if it is, if it did, I already got it. I don't remember if I did it already. Yeah, it does. Okay. Then I got it. I, okay. Well, and then the other thing is my thing where I guess like the first three letters and then like not the word like three times in a row and then finally in the last one I got it mm -hmm. there were like 10 other things on Twitter that I saw with the exact same breakdown where they guessed the first three letters but not the word and I'm like maybe like it just seems like it's, it's much more of like a hive mind I'm thing. calling it now like Wordle is not going to go away but the whole like social trend of posting your Wordle that will end by February yeah, I think it's so stupid. I because like what what are you what are they going for? Like, do you think people are gonna be like, oh my god, you're so smart? Congratulations for getting this wordle. Like, what, what, what are people? Why are people doing that? Enver, thanks for the comment, man. We appreciate that. We appreciate that feedback. Any and all feedback is welcome. Uh, we're talking wordle. It's a game. We can play it later on in the week. We're not gonna play it today because we have uh, too much to get to. We've already played today's today's game. But let's bring on Ben Hammond. Let's talk some IPOs here. I have no idea what we're in for this week on the IPO front. Yes. What? Oh, you're saying go? No, no, I was going to say, Jay Rice, did, I'm glad you got your swag. I'm jealous. I want to go to the Waste Management Open. I don't know. I will go eventually. I don't know if this year is my year. Is that the one in Arizona? Yeah, it's like the it's like the party one. I knew that. Yeah. Aren't you proud of me? I, I, I it that. looks insane. Apparently, Matt Kolb is going. Maybe I'll go with Matt. All right. Matt Hammond, how we doing, man? What's up? Not too much. Um, actually, there's stuff going on. That's not true. We'll get to it in a second. Um, I, have no, I, I didn't say there wasn't. I just have no idea. All right. Uh, yeah, there is. Surprisingly, IPO land continues to uh, you know, churn out IPOs even in this market, but we're not <laughs> seeing much uh, in the terms of companies you've ever heard of. We're kind of oh, in the low that's boring. float. That's boring. Well, yes and no. I mean, the low float IPO has been a very volatile, uh, you know, very volatile opportunity. Just got to kind of recognize where the opportunities True. are that you need to stay away from and you need to uh, see the opportunities where you can get in. Uh, but just like any IPO, the same rules kind of apply where you see uh, things come to market really overpriced. Uh, we saw one this morning, which uh, we'll get to in a second because it's just interesting. It, the stealth IPO is definitely still alive. Um, it's just you can't touch them when they're too hot. You'll get burned. 
Um, so uh, I really want to jump into it because I called it out. I said I spotted this. Uh, they try to disguise them. Um, it feels good to kind of identify it to the extent where I even force myself against all intelligence to play a tiny, tiny little uh, 25 share position and still manage to lose 500 bucks on it. So it's not a lot of money compared to what I've lost before or gained on these things, but um, feels like uh, I think playing these just for the fun of being in them is something I need to break habit on. Um, but we did have some interesting IPOs last week. We had the first and so far the only mainstream uh, IPO of the week of the year with TPG Group, which was such a safe setup that uh, even though I wasn't going to play it, I played it and took a little hundred dollar win on it. Uh, the other one was an uplisting uh, CISO. We'll just jump right into these uh, TPG Group. This is you know a very fundamentally sound uh, invest you know private equity company. And from all accounts, I understood that both TPG and the underwriter, which um, I think was, uh, it's not, it wasn't Goldman, I think it was uh, Morgan Stanley. Um, they didn't want, uh, they didn't want any egg on their face. And it was really interesting to watch this because the debut price was in the middle of the range. Uh, the range was 28 to 31, as I recall. And they priced it right in the middle of the range. So they priced it at a in a price where they could still get some kind of debut pop uh, for the IPO buyers. And then during the pre-debut indication, they held it at 32 and then 33, even though it had a really high buy side imbalance, which meant a lot of people were wanting to buy it. And they didn't want to raise the, you know, even at a 33, people wanted to buy it higher than that. But they didn't raise the price because it seemed like they just didn't want it to fall once it debuted. They could have, you know, in a strong market, probably debuted this at, you know, 35, 36, 37 or even higher. And maybe it would have run. But if they had let that happen here, it likely would have fallen. And they just didn't want to see that on this debut. So when I saw it being held at 33 with a heavy, I mean, two or 300 share buy side imbalance, and they just sat on it, they waited until you know, a few more sellers said, okay, well, I'll take, you know, I'll take my uh, $3 and 50 cent profit here and forego, uh, you know, any further up run up, which probably wasn't too hard in this market. I think people were willing to take that, uh, that play. Um, it opened up, went up to $34. Not a wait, huge wait, Matt, are, are you showing us your slides right now? Or, 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 or have uh, you yeah, been moving on this? No, there it is. We're not, we're not seeing it. We, yeah, but you, you don't have slides for these, do you? I'm just checking to make sure we're no, not. No, I do. Something's not um, connecting. Right, well. Uh-oh. Um, let me try to just stop. It. Just stop. Try it again. Yeah. Yeah, just stop the stop the share and reshare it, and that, mm -hmm. that'll probably do the trick. Share. Okay, stop the screen. <laughs> yep. Share the screen. Okay, share. I want, I want to make sure you're not missing things that you have let's try to try to scroll now do some slides oh wait here we go there we go okay, okay. there we go so there tpg go. group yeah. okay so debuted here at like 33 very short dip here in these first few minutes um you know i don't really do anything there just there wasn't too much volume and i saw a big sell side uh sell a sell order up at 34 so I said, all right, well, I'm in at 33. I don't think this is going to drop much further here. I'm just going to wait on us with my sell order at 33.95. And, you know, got in, got out. Not a big win. It's about 5%. Uh, if you held all the way through, I think it took like a 3% win. But it was, you know, 100 shares, 100 bucks. Um, and I live streamed this to kind of show people the trade. And this was a pretty safe opportunity, All you know, all things being said. Uh, if you kind of like as much, if you put as much as you could into this, it was a, you know, I, I like this as a setup. It was a mainstream IPO price not to fail. Um, the next one that we had was CISO. And this was an uplisting with our favorite uh, underwriter, Bosted Securities. Um, I was going to watch anything they do. I didn't tweet this out. I didn't really like, uh, I don't usually play uplistings. This one wasn't, I mean, you can say, oh, well, it, you know, in the pre-market, I tried to get in here at around $5 and just was 
you know, getting outbid by a few cents. There are only a few thousand shares really trading in here. So you can look at this and go, oh, well, it went from five to 870. You could have made a fortune. But you couldn't really because the volume was, I think this was one of the volume spikes here. It was like 3,000 shares, 2,000 shares. You know, maybe you could pick some up here. But if you had bought up, bought them up, you probably would have, you know, if you tried to buy 10,000 shares or something, you would have pushed the price up pretty quickly here. I was literally bidding on like 500 share blocks at a time between five dollars and 520 um, and if you hit shoot through those the next you know the next level up would have pushed this all up forward anyway it did run a bit in the pre-market what was odd about this one was that it had gone you know in the two months before the uplisting the otc shares went from about five dollars in late october to 49 dollars the day before the ip this this uplisting uh, and it was only, you know, maybe five or 10,000 shares total traded over that two months. So somebody ran the price up or cornered the market uh, going into this debut. Uh, this might have been the move that they were trying to force. Um, but, you know, I got an allocation on Webull for 30 shares or something and dumped it somewhere around here in the pre-market. Uh, if you held it into this, okay, great. Uh, if you got a bigger allocation, even better. But um, this was kind of... Once when I see something like this run into uh, that opening halt, it, it, it to me that feels like the top. Um, I was well out of it. I would have sold out there. If you didn't, you know, you probably wanted to get out here. It felt like it would come back down to five dollars. It did. Right now, it's just dipped down again to five dollars. The float on the I, on the uplisting was two million shares, but clearly OTC shares were trading. And the total shares out based on combing through the S1 look like it's about 160 million shares. So just be, um, you know, be careful with this kind of play. Uh, so that brings us to this week's IPOs. Again, it's a lot of low float stuff. I don't want to bore everyone, so we'll go through these kind of quickly. Um, the uh, I see what I'm doing wrong. Okay, so that's Cerebus. Sorry, I was on the wrong screen here. Float into, into the pre-market, peaked here, dumped off, just crossed down below. It's at 5.03 right now. Uh, this week's featured IPOs, we'll just go through them quickly. There's nothing, there's only one that I'm even sort of interested in, and otherwise we'll just be watching. Uh, Yushitsu, this went today, and this, like, I called this as a stealth IPO. I sent it out to the newsletter. If this had debuted at, like, 10 to 15, it might have given us a great opportunity uh, to play it. What I liked about it was that the underwriter was Univest Securities. They priced it at $4. Uh, this company did UPC, QLI. Those were two stealth IPOs from last year. They also did following up, follow on offerings for TIRX, TANH, and PLN, PLIN, which all you know, were either stealth IPOs at one point or made some, you know, I think PLIN we took about 80% win off when I first called that out as a move similar to pets, PETZ. Uh, so this is just, it was super sketchy. All the, the names on it were, you know, the directors and primary shareholders uh, have Chinese names. And the way that they did the uplisting sure smelled stealthy. Uh, they priced it last week and closed the IPO offering last week and then went live on the day after a holiday. So this was very suspicious to me. Um, and we see what it did. And I think I actually have this. Um, okay, here we go in real time. Okay, so this debuted at 40.99. And just because I was bored and slightly stupid maybe, bought 25 shares just to you know play with it. And lost five hundred dollars because I just sold it right here, and I didn't think about the return bounce. I just didn't want to be in it when it did this. You have to remember this is you know, and this is not something you want to play big. That just had a super low. I mean, the float on the opening trade was a thousand shares. So we've seen wow. AERC That's was nothing. one. That's nothing. Yeah, AERC priced uh, at ten dollars, debuted at forty dollars, and had this similar super low float, and then it ran up to $100 through about six halts. So I thought, okay, well, if it does that, you know, maybe I'll, you know, be in place to make a little money. If it doesn't, I can afford to take the loss. So took the loss. Um, 
kind of regretted not playing the bounce, but you don't know when that's going to come. It's tempting when you see this baseline on these to think, oh, maybe it'll do an end of day run. But you have to remind yourself at $30, this is a $4 IPO. Uh, even if there's manipulation, there's so much room for somebody to sell off, you know, one, one big seller saying, okay, well, I'll take my profits now. Uh, it's just going to drop this. And once the drop comes, it's a race to the bottom. Now we're looking at, uh, you know, 14.95. So if you got an IPO allocation, you wanted to sell that way up here, only a thousand people have managed or a thousand shares got to, uh, you know, get out at that price. So, um, if you were given, if you didn't panic sell down here, um, you got out at 30, um, you know, congratulations, you made a 25, you know, $26 per share. Uh, at this point, it's, you know, you're playing with fire, trying to time anything. You could say, oh, well, it's way oversold and, you know, it's going to, oh, you know, it's going to bounce back. Right. I don't know. It's a $4 stock. It's also a company that had $220 million in uh, revenue in the year ending March 31st, 2021. So I have no idea what's going on with this stock. It's not something I really want to hold at this time. I'm, you know, loading up on names that I think will, you know, are at bottoms and will turn around and otherwise kind of staying out of the market. So don't touch this at this point is my advice, but this is not financial or trading advice. We're just looking at, uh, at the IPO that today did something that um, is in that kind of fringe fringe world of crazy Chinese stocks on the internet. So we know that stealth IPOs are in play now. Um, they're just harder to spot and not giving us, uh, that's not a party that you're invited to. Just watch from the sidelines. Don't try to take money on it. Okay, Jupiter Neurosciences is a biotech that actually kind of looks interesting. The underwriter is not someone I've ever heard of really before. Um, what's interesting about this is that it's an Alzheimer's platform. Um, that also kind of has a COVID app angle to it. So they do neuroinflammation. Anything COVID has been somewhat interesting. And they were, you know, phase one trials were backed by the National Institute on Aging. Now, I'm not saying play this IPO, but there have been opportunities in recent uh, kind of biotech IPOs to pick up some shares if they drop on the debut. I believe this one has warrants involved that they're floating units. So, you know, if this price is at $5, the IPO, it'll start trading below that at like 420 or something, and then probably drop off. What I like to do is watch these for dips to like 250, 260. And then as soon as the quiet period expires, they'll drop a headline. Uh, we saw this with NXGL recently, which is one I kind of shouted out on Twitter. Um, it got like, uh, if you pick that one up, last week at like 250 or 260 um i think on friday or thursday last week it ran over five to over five dollars in the pre-market on some lame headline Jeez. like they're Jeez selling Louise. on amazon so um some of these like recent low float biotechs when they dip down you can start accumulating a little bit of a position and it doesn't take much of a headline with just three million shares for these to blow up um it's worked out pretty well for me there's other people who really focus on that so um, just an idea. That's all we're doing out here is sharing ideas. Okay, Four Springs Capital Trust. This is sort of a mainstream IPO. It's a real estate investment trust. They raise money to fund acquisitions to pay debt. Um, they own 122 properties, uh, additional interest in 34 other properties. They've like, I saw- Do you, know what, do you know what kind of real estate this is? Yeah, is they do like single reason? tenant uh, like okay. businesses it looks like. So medical, okay. industrial, service operators. So- okay. Okay, so com office. commercial is the okay. Commercial, yeah, yeah. Um, and the float is 18 million shares. Not really interesting as an IPO trade to me. Um, so, but it is interesting in the sense that we finally have some businesses that are not just low float gimmick IPOs trying to come to market. So, keep an eye on it uh, just to see if. And and I, and I believe that the rest of the IPO market is watching every mainstream IPO to see if they are real or not, because we've seen a lot of IPOs getting pulled uh, as expected due to poor market conditions, which is another way of saying investors, institutional hedge funds don't really want to buy IPOs right now. And companies either have to give up a lot more equity than they want to, to raise some money, 
or they have to be so strong that they just don't care. And I think this is going to be the case until we get those. You know, I think we need to get this market through about March or April before things start looking up. And until start thinking, that, you know, until I mean, we talk about, well, growth stocks are being hammered. Uh, interest rates are killing, um, you know, that, what are IPOs, if not growth stocks? We're going to see. By, defini by definition, you know, I mean. So this is a, you know, when, it, when we see some IPOs start to come through, that might, that's also, there's a lot of traders who see IPOs being scheduled as kind of the bigger powers involved in shaping the market, recognizing that they believe the market is turning around. So even with TPG, there were people saying, tr you know, trading off that saying, well, you know, markets way down on Monday, they're still keeping the TPG group IPO on for Thursday. So we're betting on things like looking better by Wednesday or they're, you know, that they're going to hold up the market at least until Wednesday to get TPG out and which, you know, coincidentally or not, they did. Uh, we had a pretty big rally into Wednesday morning. Fed announced those C that CPI data market sold off pretty quickly or was that? Sorry, that was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah that was last enough, week. Yeah. Strong enough on Wednesday to, you know, to push TPG group out. And then, you know, the market kind of folded from there. So uh, after that, we've got one that I really have to wonder if they're going to go through with this one. It's a Bitcoin miner, Rhodium Enterprises. Bitcoin miner with proprietary technology and liquid cooling check tech to mine Bitcoin. Uh, with crypto down, there's not a lot of enthusiasm for miners. So uh, sorry, the, lo the float on this one was actually 7 million shares. Uh, didn't put that in there. So um, 7 million shares, but uh, it's not a super sketchy one. And I've never heard of Needham and company. So it doesn't look like it's going to nah, get. They're, they're pretty legit. They're pretty yeah. legit. Yeah. I just, they're pretty to me right they now, are, they, I, they are legit. Not pretty. They are legit. They're legit. Okay. Yeah. So that's just giving them the, uh, the bump here. Yeah, they, they, They're a pretty large firm, mm -hmm. like a mid-sized firm. Yeah. So there are, and I always look at that. It's kind of like there's almost tier one, tier two, tier three, tier three is sort of like what we saw and what drew me to the, uh, Yoshitsu IPO is that Univest, the underwriter that handled that has been involved with a whole bunch of sketchy, shady. I mean, yeah. something's always up with anything they're involved with. So that's what put it on my radar. Uh, Needham and company, is a little bit like the next one we're going to talk about, which has done some, uh, you know, some sort of IPOs that low float IPOs that flew, but not, you know, they've also done a lot of just kind of, you know, SPACs and uh, kind of tier two companies, companies that didn't uh, attract Goldman and um, Morgan Stanley, which are sort of like, the, you know, the gold standard ones. Um, but th there's nothing particularly exciting about this. And I, unless you're long-term bullish Bitcoin and you want to get in on miners as a, you know, in instead of holding the coins, uh, you know, watch for a dip on this and buy it. Otherwise this is not, not an exciting IPO to me. Uh, FGI industries. This one's interesting because the float is just 2.5 million shares. Uh, there is a connection to China in that they source bath and kitchen products from China and sell them uh, globally, but I'm not too interested in the financials. This is either a stealth IPO uh, being played by, uh, you know, the benchmark company. They did AERC, which debuted the day before Thanksgiving, which was weird. Um, it opened at, it priced at 10, opened at 40 and then ran up over 100. Uh, something weird was going on there. BFRI was one um, that, I think that was the ticker, I might have got that wrong. BFRI was one that debuted, middled around a little bit, and then went on some big run a couple months later, and this was in 2020. So they've done some IP, but I think that's a biotech. They've done some IPOs that t ended up being kind of pumped, um, but generally they're involved with IPOs that look like pretty standard fare. Um, that doesn't mean they're not capable. We saw a Maxim group get they, involved. They're, they're also like, no, they're not, maybe not as large as Needham, but they're like a known commodity. I feel like benchmark they've. 
but so is Maxim Group, and they 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 seem to do a lot of low float IPOs, and they did uh, okay. they did SOPA, okay. and SOPA was clearly a stealth IPO in uh, retrospect. We did point it out as a smelled like a stealth IPO, um, and it's made a couple weird runs. It went ballistic on day one and day two, pulled way back down to like three dollars a share, and then got uh, included in the Russell. This was at the end of December. And then when they got that inclusion in the Russell low float, everybody came in and uh, got back into it and it ran up to like 17 or something. So uh, that, that, sorry, that was in reference to Maxim Group just pointing out that I think Benchmark Company has some runs with some shady deals, but also has a lot of really more normal deals. But anytime you see 2.5 million shares without warrants, in this market, day traders will latch onto it. It runs at some point, whether it dips first or uh, it runs right out the gates, you know, to be to be determined. Um, but this is probably this week the only one that I'm sort of interested in maybe playing on the debut. I certainly won't go big on it. I certainly won't chase it if it's priced at five and uh, debuts at fifteen. I probably won't even touch that even though that's sort of the stealth setup. Um, trying to be a little bit more cautious at this point on things. Samsara Vision, this is the last one of this week. Sounds pretty cool. They implant miniature telescopes into your eye uh, to help treat macular What? Yeah. And they've done <laughs> their own. They're, they're, they're doing this. this is like Elon Musk isn't doing that. Uh, maybe he is. Yeah. Well, why not? I mean, that what I mean, what a miniature telescope. What is a lens? You know, we they, they, people implant. Right. Uh, yeah, but it's cooler when you say telescope. It is. Um, makes me think of some cyber, yeah, cyber robot things or something. But yeah, it is cool. Uh, they're in the early commercial stages in Europe, so they actually do have a little bit of revenue. Um, but they have to go through FDA for the for USA. The underwriter is Think Equity. So again, uh, hey. this is one that has done a lot of these sort of low float biotech, low float, uh, the SOPA they've done, they're hit and miss. I mean, you don't want to hang your hat on it being think equity, but they do kind of seem to want to get to that point where, you know, Bosted is kind of like the B-O-U-S-T-E-A-D. Bosted security is sort of the one where almost anything they take, people are kind of like, well, as long as it doesn't debut too high, I want to, you know, there's something up, there's something shady. Like they almost uh, relish being um, painted as, you know, the shady IPO company or the shady offering company because they can bring, you know, they bring these just highly combustible uh, IPOs to market the price at five and go to, you know, have gone on insane runs. But, uh, I think this is one of uh, this one falls more into that basket of all right let's let it drop for a bit and then maybe buy what we think is the bottom before the quiet period ends and when the quiet period ends we can you know wait for some headlines because um it, it i like the medical device ones because they don't take as much to go through fda uh and they like we saw with this company iinn which i keep talking about because i really think they're doing something incredible and i've made a ton of money on it already and i'm reloading down here at uh to 294 right now pick up shares there um but you know uh when you're talking about you know hardware instead of uh pharmaceuticals the fda process is a lot easier and they can start doing things like signing pre you know distribution deals um, before they go through, they've already done a generation one of their device and, you know, they've now taken the feedback they're doing generation two, uh, they can go sign deals and those deals when they sign them are conditional on FDA approval, but those deals pump the share price up pretty significantly. So right. that's something, uh, I, I kind of like these plays for, wait for them to bottom out a little bit, wait a few days after the IPO. Um, you know, if you got some, you know, cash laying around you can kind of like park you know buy a thousand shares of this or you know 100 shares of this and then you know wait for the quiet period to expire expires usually like a month after the ipo and then uh see where you know see where it's going um let's look just to take a look at this tklf again this is a you know if you're a day trader you know how to read all this stuff maybe 
you don't get caught there, but you get in here. Um, it's halted again. I mean, you go look at the halt list. It's TKLF up and down all day today. Um, but these low float IPOs, stealth IPOs, who knows where this ends. This could go to 50 tomorrow or it could go down to five. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to touch it, but always interesting to me. That's, All right, M that's Matt Hammond, <laughs> IPOWarriors.com. He joins us every single Monday. Normally, obviously, Monday was a uh, holiday today so or this yeah. week, so he joined us Tuesday. But, uh, Matt, uh, a pleasure as always, man. Thanks for joining us today, and, uh, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, guys. Uh, sign up for the newsletter at IPOWarriors.com, please. Uh, I send out these stealth IPOs, the IPO list. I uh, have a recap of or preview of all the IPOs that are coming up uh, this week. And appreciate the support, guys. All righty. Uh, it is 101. So we've got a couple of minutes here where Aaron and I are going to hang out. We will bring on our next guest in... Uh, 14 or so minutes, the, the guest that, uh, we are, uh, extremely excited for, uh, Lauren Simmons, uh, you know, former floor trader, uh, and also the host of going public, uh, this, this brand new show. They've got a very, uh, interesting concept. Um, but actually what Aaron and I really want to know is how she got here on a Wikipedia page. So maybe we can find out about that and then we can, uh, get to the actual, you know, well, I think Shelly's right. Shelly said earlier, anyone can make a Wikipedia page. So. Are you saying Lauren made her own Wikipedia? No, page? no, 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 no. We'll have to all. get to the bottom of this. I'm saying that I think you just have to do some cool things, and then someone out there will make you a Wikipedia page. That is a good question, though. Like for individuals that have Wikipedia pages, what percentage of them were self-made? Hmm. That's a stat I would love to know. I'll tell you what, I think Spencer, we'll never get to the bottom of that. I'll one. tell you what, Spencer. One day I'll have a Wikipedia page, and I'll promise you that it was not myself that made it. Oh wow! What a, what 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 a, what a all right, hey man. All right, that that's a goal. People talk about having like like life goals. That's a life goal right there, right? Get your own Wikipedia page. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. I wonder if uh, do you think like Jason has his own Wikipedia page? Oh, I don't think Jason does actually. No, he doesn't. Shoot, we dude, should make that one. would be a birth. <laughs> love that, dude. That, that would be like a birthday present. No, don't yeah. like for real though. Like, uh, like his birthday that, is coming up, March, right? That's a February? birthday present. All right, yo, we are you and me are doing that. We're not telling anyone. No one here is gonna get in on this action. We're gonna kiss some serious butt to our boss. Uh, anyway, it's one hundred two. Let's just take stock of things. Obviously, the market is still down for the day. That's kind of uh, the way things go. Um, the Wall Street Journal has been all over this Activision Microsoft story, uh, and they reported here. I just saw a, a little detail from them. I was wondering about this. There was two things I was wondering about. One, will Bobby Kotick uh, stay on with Activision? He's, of course, the founder, the CEO, the figurehead. Uh, they are saying that uh, he will not. The journal Well, saying, it, was, it was first reported that he would. Well, no, the press release said he, he will stay on like the, the until the deal is closed, right? Got it. It, it was vague about. So I saw a headline earlier that was like expected to to stay, and right. then I got the other headline a few minutes ago that said expected to leave. So right. The 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 second one is like after the deal closes. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, I was wondering like, if this didn't just come out of the blue, there's no way. But the journal reported that Microsoft approached Activision in November, which is when all the stuff kind of hit the fan uh, a few months ago. Um, so I was wondering about that. Cause That's when I hit the fan, but that this has been the Activision lawsuits you're, and stuff have been in the news for you're right. 18 months or so. Yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Uh, also, talk, talk to me, Goose. Look, this isn't just a show for, for stock advice. For Well, actually, we don't do advice. We do entertainment, right? Compliance. <laughs> we don't give advice. We <laughs> are not advisors. We're just guys on the internet. Yeah, we're just having fun. <laughs> um, but not just entertainment in uh in finance and stock market will give you some good life pro tips am i allowed to say that can i say pro tips life pro tips yeah, sure wait, wait he's saying he's saving money on his anniversary gift because she's getting a wikipedia page let, if, us know, if, let us know how that goes if your partner if that took a thing if your partner would like that go for it mine would not appreciate that at all so i uh, unfortunately i can't i can't uh copy that from, from my own gain but uh yeah hey the idea is is free of charge. Um, other uh, quick PSA, just quick public service announcement before we move on here. I just got texted this link by my mom actually. Uh -oh. 
My mom Are you just gonna get Rick rolled. No, 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 no. My mom just texted me this link. I'll put it in the chat. Okay, special.usps.com. We can all now order free COVID test kits. If you are short, if you don't, if you need them, um, I'll put it up on the screen. Again, the link is uh, very simple. I actually just tried to do this, um, <laughs> and uh, they said they couldn't validate my address. So <laughs> that's because you don't have an address, Rohan. Listen, get an address first, and then the USPS will be able to deliver they don't stuff need to, to you. Know that, all right? I'll just put the office down or something. <laughs> Dude, that's what I do. <laughs> Wait, are you telling me the government rollout of this web page wasn't perfect? That's uh, that might be what I'm. Well, that's what he's telling you. I'm, I'm, I didn't say anything. Um, um, I'm not shocked. You anyway, the rollout uh, of Obamacare, like oh, the man. fiasco. Yeah, it was bad. Uh, this is not this. This is not. This, that. Is, not, this is not that. <laughs> anyway, uh, free COVID test kits are uh, apparently available if you go to that link in the chat, and that was on the screen before. Spencer, your phone's ringing. No, it's not. No, over there. Oh. Okay. Randy? That sucks. <laughs> Somebody want to answer the, my, my, my phone for yeah. me? I don't, don't know who's calling me, but it. it, it uh, Do you see I, how quickly Spencer thought I was wrong about his phone ringing? My phone's right here. I was like, no, my phone is not ringing. You've got two phones. People though. prank me all the time at, at this company. It's that is true. ridiculous. Spencer's a great this friend. morning, we're in an all hands meeting, and I'm speaking to the whole company, and Luke goes, Spencer, we can't hear you. <laughs> People were so quick to ruin the joke, too, because, like, I think myself, Neil, maybe a handful of others knew right away what Luke was doing, but everyone else was, like, typing in the chat, like, we can hear you, Spencer. Yeah. We don't bully. It's not bullying, Shelly. It's not bullying. There, you see. I heard it from him. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know anymore. Anyway, okay. Um, we're gonna have we're gonna bring Lauren on. In a call. I know Lauren's not actually on the schedule for like one fifteen, but maybe we bring her on a few minutes early because I see her lurking in the background. Um, so we can she's probably got that. better things to say than we do, right? Um, or yeah, more. yeah, she does. I, I I just wanted to just real quick just take again. I like just taking stock of things, right? We've got broad based red across the board today. I'm looking at the major indexes. I'm looking at the the sectors and uh I feel like there was one other thing that I wanted to talk to you about that we haven't discussed yet. Oh um, um, we didn't talk banks at all today. I don't know if this was it, but did you see I kinda wanna buy the banks right now. Um I said that already. Did you see Apple is in talks to buy licensing rights for MLB games? Oh that was like a Friday thing, right? I know, but it's like yeah. we were already like Yeah 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 no like I, long I, weekend I was already out. Yeah. No, I, I, I saw that on Friday. Because yeah. that goes hand in hand with what we were talking about just right now, how valuable the rights to these uh, to, to the sporting events are. Because, uh, And I don't want to sound like a broken record because I know I've made this point on the show before, but right now sports are one of the only things that people will watch live. Uh, like if you look at the list of a hun the 100 top most uh, watched live Here. things over the past five years. It's like 95 sporting events and then five like presidential debates or something. Uh, okay, I have a potential trade here. It's a potential short based on what he just said. Okay. okay. SBGI, Sinclair. There aren't a lot of companies that have exposure to the regional sports networks, the RSNs, the very companies that Amazon and Apple are now competing with. Uh, but SB, let me bring up the chart. SB, Sinclair, is that the group that went out, that's gone out and bought like a bunch of local news outlets over the past like 10, 15 years? Yeah, and they bought, they paid like $9 billion for like all these regional sports networks. That and they're kind of like political, or don't they? Yeah, they, yes. They're like they like right wing, like don't they? Yes, yes. Turn so, these local news outlets into like right wing yes, websites? Yes, Um yeah, I'm short that. No, but like just from the, from what he was just saying, just from like the, the sports point of view, there again, this is a company that has direct exposure they 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 own the networks that that broadcast all the major sports right and those networks viewership is is cratering people are cutting the cord there's no direct to consumer so what are, we, are we talking about the regional like bally sports yeah or fox I'm, sports i'm talking like fox sports i'm talking Bally. Okay. yep that's what i'm talking about this company owns a lot of them um it's not a great space to be in right now their timing was pretty bad so potential short here off of it's not any catalyst it's just a a macro trend right that sports rights are going to go to amazon. apple apple amazon, amazon right maybe netflix netflix for all we know who, who the Hulu. Heck knows? anyway um yeah talk to me there we go that's what we're talking about roy i will tell my mom you said you're welcome for the link <laughs> <laughs> 
she, um, she, I don't, I don't usually respond to her messages, so she'll appreciate the response either way. You um, don't respond to your mom's messages? No, no. Th- 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 this was like a group. It was a group text. It went oh, to like okay. twenty people. Well, I implore you. I'm not going to respond to a group text because, whatever. Anyway, um, should we just bring on uh, Lauren? I feel like we should. I feel like we're just bloviating right now, and uh, I see Lauren Simmons here in the background. So, um, again, we are very excited to have Lauren on the show here today. She is, uh, or was, uh, the youngest, right? Youngest woman ever to, to, to become a full-time trader on the floor of the, uh, of the NICE. She is now the host of a new show called Going Public. We're going to talk all about that show. Um, but should we bring her on? Let's do it. Let, let, let's well, give if her, she's ready. Of let's give her the special intro. And then, and Maybe she gives us like a thumbs up or something. Show. I, I think she's ready. Let's oh, she's it. ready. Let's, let's give, go. Let, let's give her the special intro. <laughs> Lauren, how are we doing today? I'm doing great. How are y'all? We are doing fantastic. So answer us this. How does one get their own Wikipedia page? Uh, not by creating your own, um, <laughs> wink, wink. Think you can, like if you, if your email address has the same name as your name, you can't even like add to the wiki Wikipedia page, nor can you create the Wikipedia page. It's oh. like rules and levels to it. But one day someone was like, you have a Wikipedia page. And I was like, what? Like I'm cool enough to have my own Wikipedia page. What even is that? That's um, awesome. So yeah. Wait. So was was my background correct? You were the you were the youngest woman to to trade on the floor of the NICE. Was that right? I was the youngest ever. <laughs> youngest woman, ever. Woman, man, etc. A- anything. Don't yeah. sell her short, Spencer. <laughs> I, I'm. That's why I asked for clarification. Um. But yeah, I was, and I yeah, and then I also made history by becoming the second African American woman to ever work down there. Um, and yeah, I, I thoroughly awesome. enjoyed my time on the trading floor. Awesome. Well, what was that like? Just uh, you know, having, having never done that. <laughs> intense. Um, interesting. I don't think it's exactly what people make it out to be on TV because I think with a lot of technology, a lot of things are now more passive. So it's not as aggressive as, you know, we would probably see in like the Wolf of Wall Street. But the op- open and closed and really big IPOs, it was, it was everything and then some. Wow, I bet, yeah. I mean, we see it on our screens, but I'm sure it's nothing compared to what you experienced in person. So, anyway, you are the host of this this really cool show. It's got a really cool concept called Going Public. Um, tell us about this show. What exactly is going on here? Yeah, so we are following four companies in real time as they are looking to raise capital. We have uh, really cool companies such as Treble, NGT Academy, uh, Proven Skincare, and, um, you know, I'm really in Hammett, luxury retail company, and I'm so grateful to be part of this show. And I think what is really interesting, why this is so revolutionary is that Um, In order to participate in pre-IPO, you typically have to have a net worth over a million dollars. And with Reg A, which was signed into law during the Obama administration, anyone globally over the age of 18 can be able to purchase uh, shares in a company pre-IPO. And we know that's really where the generational wealth is created because pre-IPO prices are significantly lower than what you would get once a company lists on an exchange floor. We're talking about $5 stocks to when it lists for like $125. So it, it's a it's a grand difference. Yeah, so this is a show that's like I said, just following companies in their journey to go public. And then the catch or the twist is that like the viewers, people like the rest of us can invest in the company, right? Yeah. Along the way? Yep, along the way at any time. So what you would do is you would go on goingpublic.com. You would learn more about the companies, read their offering circular. Like I can't emphasize that enough. When we're making, you know, investments, we should really be doing our due diligence. And then from there, you can click to invest. That's awesome. So episode one is out, right? That was out this morning? Yes, it launched today, and we've been working on this project. I've been part of this project for two years. They've been working on it way longer wow. than I've been on it. And, um, yeah, through trials and tribulations, 
uh, with, you know, entrepreneurs and startups and, and hiccups along the way. We had a few release dates and then had to push it back. And so I'm so grateful to be starting 2022 uh, with the release of this show. And I think everyone is going to be so enamored by the companies and what this show uh, mission and purpose is. So it's sort of like, um, uh, it, it, it's like a shark tank meets start. You remember the podcast startup, the startup podcast, it's sort of like that, but for, but video obviously. And, yeah. and, and with companies that, that are going public, yeah. um, is, I'm curious, like, is there anything that's like surprised you the most about like anything you didn't see coming just in terms of like the the fundraising process or the dynamic between these companies, these founders and, and these mentors that, that you've like found for them? Well, we learn later on in the show, we go through this process where we are going through tr traditional fundraising, um, capital raising. And so we're in a very, uh, a demographic that skews older. And yeah. I think the, the, audience in that live setting didn't really understand the companies they're really easy to get right there you know we have streaming platforms we have luxury retail we have military grade mm -hmm. it academy we have you know skincare meets tech um everything that we use in our day-to-day -day. but i think the older audience um didn't get it as much which is why i think um going public is as out as powerful as it is because these are real authentic stories and real companies that are a representation of what's going on and especially to this younger demographic that notoriously has not had a seat at the table um yeah. you know on wall street so i i think that's what surprised me that like it made sense in my head but to hear people say what is a streaming platform is you know crazy but you know it, yeah. there is an audience for for different companies and and so on. Uh, JJ is asking, do you have to be a U.S. person or I think just in the U.S. to invest? Lauren, do you actually, yeah. I don't know the answer to that. Globally, no? one over the age of 18. Um, and okay. Anywhere can be able to invest. Um, I did put the link in the chat for those asking. Check it out. It's also in the description of this video. Uh, Lauren Simmons, the host of Going Public. The reason I'm excited here is because we talk all the time about like disrupting the process, right? Uh, whether it's via like a direct listing or even a SPAC, all things that avenues that are not the conventional IPO way. And this just takes that. I mean, the reggae process has been around, right? It's not mm -hmm. like a new thing, but mm -hmm. this just takes that and it takes it to the next level because you've got content. You've got interactive, right? I mean, you can like invest as they're doing it. Um, I mean, I, I'm. This is why I'm super excited. I, I can't wait to see how uh, how this plays out. So it's one episode every single week, mm -hmm. and episode one went live today. Yes. So every every Tuesday, right? Yes, every Tuesday, eight a.m. Eastern Standard Time, it will drop, and it will be streaming on Entrepreneur as well as on Bazinga, and uh, on YouTube as well. Yep. Again, check it out. Uh, the link is in the chat in the description. Um, and uh, bug log in the chat. I don't know the answer to your question. How long do you have to keep the stock to sell it? Um, check. All, I'll, I'll say. I'll echo what Lauren said. Just check whatever the offering circular says. Lauren, maybe we need to do a segment about how to read those because uh, <laughs> those things are confusing. Um, but and yeah. That's that's one of the things about me being the host of the show is like I'm really breaking down some of these financial terms that jargon that people often think are really intimidating or don't understand. But I yeah. also break down what is Ray A, what is the offering circular. The, the main page that people should really look at is like the risk factors and what that actually means. Um, because the reality is when you're investing in any early startup company, um, there are higher risk that is associated with that. And, you know, I tell people really understand what you are investing in, but with high For risk sure. obviously comes high reward. So I'm, I say lean into it, um, assess what your risk tolerance is. And, you know, if you're someone who's definitely investing in crypto and like this new digital era, certainly you can be able to invest in early startup companies. You, you've already been doing it. And in some respects, it's like, it could almost be considered like a different asset. I mean, it's really not because it's like an equity investment in, in a yeah. company, but like it kind of is different, right? Because you're getting this like pseudo private slash public thing 
that may behave a little bit differently, right? So it's not just a straight, you're not just straight up buying a stock on the public markets, but you're also not really, you're not doing a private round either. You're sort of in between there. So in a sense, it sort of is like, can maybe considered a, a different asset class, maybe not quite, but like a different kind of investment. You know what I mean? Well, it's so, alternative investing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. There we go. So uh, I, I, that's what, that's what I was getting at. Um, and yeah, there are lockups, there are terms for own investments, obviously check the offering. Uh, but we, so episode one aired, aired today, we, we met the companies, right? And now, will each episode like feature a different one? Or are we going to follow all of them at the same time? So the first episode features Hammett and Proven and the additional episodes will feature the two other companies. And then yeah. you know, we, we kind of go through, um, the road show and other different process. So yeah, you'll, you'll learn about different companies through different episodes. Awesome. So yeah, it is, it is like a pseudo diversification. Uh, I'm going to put the link in the chat one more time. There it is. Again, it is in the description of this video. The series is called going public. Uh, extremely exciting. Um, I don't, I, I think that you answered all my questions, Lauren. I've got I, I, some. Yeah. Okay. Go, go for so, it. <laughs> Uh, Lauren, I saw, I saw you on Good Morning America, I guess, what was that a couple months ago now? Yeah, in November. How was that? I just want to know about the experience. Oh, it was amazing. TJ and Michael were great. Um, it was, you know, definitely a whirlwind. I was having a, an anxiety attack before I went on, um, but they were such lovely individuals and uh, super grateful. I mean, I, I feel like I have been put in really cool scenarios and i don't even know sometimes i have these out of body experiences and i wish i was a little bit more present because sometimes like watching the clip back i'm like was that even me like was i there um, yeah like you almost like black like you don't even remember it but you're watching the clip and you know like oh yeah i, I was there that yeah, was real <laughs> yeah um so yeah it was it was definitely truly incredible and definitely grateful for the opportunity yeah, I'm jealous. I mean, I've been watching uh, Michael Strahan both a, as a football player and then his uh, obviously post playing career now for 15 years. So I would have been uh, undoubtedly very starstruck. So again, that was that was awesome. I'm just curious because I don't know if I've ever spoken to someone that's been on Good Morning America before. <laughs> yeah, well, here I am. But you know what's also <laughs> about Michael is like um, I'm also really petite, so I'm five one. So I'm seeing this like giant man, and he's like you got this like be calm i'm like be calm i'm like yeah you're like i, I could fit in the gap between your teeth <laughs> oh oh man all right um <laughs> wait well, wait question from our chat easy mike wants to know when when's the movie i don't even know what he's talking about do you know what he's talking about yeah i have a, a movie coming out with agc studios starring kiersey clements and the movie is still in development you have to thank you know COVID and all these other great things that have been happening that has delayed that but yeah i you know the script is wonderful the the cast is great so i i can't wait for everyone to see the movie as well all right yeah easy mike also he's, he's a loyal viewer in our chat he said uh his his son really likes you so i don't know uh easy mike maybe you'll give us some more some more context there i don't know what that means i, I, I thought easy mike had like a five-year-old son i thought he had like a, i don't know <laughs> i don't know i don't know it could be uh no idea five could be i don't know um but, but lord i have another kind of outside the box question so i did some uh linkedin investigating stalking whatever you want to call it S sleuthing yeah. sleuthing that's a, the, good, that's a good word yeah. for it um and i saw some interesting like jobs from when you were younger maybe in high school college um do you think someone because i'd be curious how many you know new york stock exchange floor traders and whatnot really had to work like hourly wage jobs when they were younger i know i i find my experience both as a you know i worked at a car wash as a waiter like i feel like those experiences have really helped me further in my in my professional career um mm -hmm. and i'm curious if you feel similar similarly i think that the let me think about this the new york stock exchange um a lot of men that work there obviously come from um, more wealthier backgrounds. And so their experiences growing up, I think, are different. Meaning, you know, my first job ever was at McDonald's. And then I worked, you know, for my family's like deli. And then I worked as a lifeguard. Uh, 
And, you know, individuals at 16 working at the New York Stock Exchange had different experiences of what their summer looked like. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, it's, you know, it is what it is. But, yeah, I, I would, you know, as far as, like, the summer jobs or internships, I think it looked a lot different from mine or from, from most middle Americans. But as far as, like, degrees, surprisingly, a lot of men on the trading floor did not go to school for finance. Like, I, I knew a man on the floor who had a woodcutting degree or, like, art history degree or, like, you know, it, it just varied. So but obviously their um, accessibility to be able to get a job on the trading floor looked a lot different from mine. And nepotism is definitely... Uh, not a bad thing, but it's it's a real thing, and it definitely opens doors for certain individuals. So that okay, that that answers my question. Yeah, because I'm <laughs> that, that's kind of surprising actually that not everyone on the on the uh, New York Stock Exchange floor, you know, was a you know prep school kid that went to Wharton or whatever. Like some of them got different degrees in college, but well, that um, doesn't mean that they didn't go to Wharton. That just means that they didn't study finance. <laughs> I didn't say that. Like a lot okay. of them definitely went to the Ivies or and you know or you know went to Fordham and you know so on and so forth. But that doesn't mean that they study finance in school. Fair. That's fair. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Lauren Simmons is the host of the brand new show going public streaming live on entrepreneur um, and uh, we are so excited to talk to you again links in description link to watch link on disclosures links to the offerings links to each company's offering that is all in the description of this video Lauren uh, thanks for hanging out with us today I uh, I hope you had fun. I, I think we did, and we very much look forward to uh, to watching the show every week. Thank you. I really appreciate it. If you guys have any questions, please be sure to check out and follow Going Public as well as my um, Instagram, L.A. Simmons, and we're here to help. But I will definitely be back soon, and thank you. I enjoyed my All time right. as well today. All right. Have a good one, Lauren. Have a good one. All right. All right. Again, all the links, the links at the bottom of the screen, the links from the description, they're in the chat. They're everywhere I can think to put them. Uh, I can't make it easier, to my knowledge. Uh, but just get some likes. Let's go. I mean, that was that was fantastic. I, I enjoyed. I, I, we're getting Lauren on the show again, right? I, I one, yes, yes. I, I, I don't like, know when exactly. It may be, it may be a few weeks. But yes, we we will get Lauren. I, I think so. What we've done is like we've 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 partnered with Going Public uh, on on this project just a little bit here, and I think what we're going to do is we're going to try to bring the executives from each company that are on the show. We're going to bring try to bring them on our show, like the day that that the day of an episode, right? And so we can talk a little bit about you know stuff that was covered in the episode, what wasn't covered in the show, and then learn more about these companies. Um, so. Uh, very, I, I'm super excited for this project because, again, it's it's the amalgam of capital markets and and content and, and interactivity. There's there's three things, right? And it's bringing them all together. It's kind of, I honestly, I think this kind of thing might be like the future. Oh, I mean, I, well, yeah. I mean, in general, I think we're moving toward uh, a space in finance, particularly. Um, where, where, where we truly are getting to that point, you know, people throw around democratizing as like a buzzword all the time. Because it is. Um, it, it is a buzzword, yeah. right? So is disruptive. But That's true. we are, are getting to a point where 50 years ago, guys like you and I, Spencer, had, had no access to investing in, in pre-IPO companies. Zero. Uh, now we do have 50 access. 50 years ago. I would, have, do, I would argue 10 years ago. Do we have access? Yeah. I was, Five years I was, ago. I was, I was being safe. Five years ago. I was being safe. I was being safe. <laughs> But uh, does that mean we have access to all, all the best pre-IPOs? Do we have the, truly the same opportunities as some of the big guys? No, maybe not. But are we moving in the right direction? Yes. Uh, yeah. And then content-wise, just outside of finance, 100% this is where we, ha we are heading. Um, you know, where content, I think, will continue to become more and more interactive, like on screen, certainly hope call so. to actions. We actually just saw this with Spotify. Uh, I'm sure I'm not the only one here with us today that listens to podcasts but if you listen to podcasts you know oftentimes they do uh, advertisement readings and now on spotify they're going to have call to action cards that pop up so when i don't know uh that's good throw a throw a but when mcdonald's ad on 
uh, the and, and on the on the Ben Simmons podcast, no, it's not his name. Bill Simmons podcast pops yeah. up that you can click on the you can click on the McDonald's ad right there and order your Big Mac. So I think we're moving yeah. to this area where it's like a lot more interactive. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, and speaking of podcasts, Wait, can I borrow your charger if, and you can finish your thought? Yeah, yeah. sure. Thanks. Uh, speaking of podcasts, I was listening over the weekend yes or yesterday to an episode of. Uh, NPR's Radio Lab, and I think they just replayed an okay. old episode. They do that a lot, and they don't tell you it's a replay. It pisses me off. Yeah, on anyway. the, like you click on it, and they're like, "Well, we're gonna revisit this from our 2016 episode that we that. did." And I'm I like, "Well, that. you could have told me that in the title." I hate that. Uh, but NPR, just like everyone else, knows how to repurpose some content. But anyway, uh, this one was about, I think it was called Dark Dark Code, Dark Code, Dark Code, some like black market type website where people can essentially buy. Uh, like hackers that can put ransomware or whatever out there. Anyway, the story was about some like old lady that got her computer hacked, and they said, "Okay, if you want your your files back, uh, you need to send us five hundred dollars in Bitcoin." So it was kind of all about crypto's role in mm-hmm. this, uh, in this like in this industry. And the mm-hmm. site that they made her go to for Bitcoin, I guess, asked like, "What? Why are you buying this Bitcoin?" And like to pay a ransom was the top <laughs> the top hit and then they had the guys on so this is why I, this is why i like content like this from NPRs because they do they do really good like deep reporting like they went out and then interviewed uh the executives of this crypto platform and they were like yeah we know this is like the number one reason people are using our platform and not only that the like russian hackers are giving the victims this platform as their like preferred method and they're like on one end we are, are like helping these people get their files back that they so desperately want. On the other hand, we know we're abetting a, a criminal activity and they're actually having active conversations like with banks about, could you be seen as knowingly uh, you know, participating in these criminal acts and putting yourself at risk? Um, but yeah, I mean, it was just all about how how, how do you know how we got on this pod, this tangent. Because <laughs> I because I, I, I said podcast, and then it made me think oh, about okay. it. But, but but the main point is just about crypto's like growing role in this growing yeah. uh, problem of like cyber attacks, and it's not just like companies whatever getting hacked. There's like individuals getting hacked out there and then held for for ransom. So, yeah. and we'll the see. last thing I want to add, just on the going public note, is like there is a big difference right between owning a private company. And owning a public company, they're they are completely different ball games, right? And I'm excited for like more education. I'm excited f- personally for me to learn more about owning a private company. What does it actually mean? You know what I mean? Uh, like, how does the private market really behave? W- we know a lot, a lot of the the gains and losses are are on paper, um, and also the you know the private market is a lot more forgiving, right? Um, of of growth companies because that's you know by design the way it is but i i'm just very excited to learn more about the private market and sort of how the whole market behaves because the stock market is not forgiving you screw up one quarter they will let they they will punish you uh private market probably doesn't mind if you screw up a quarter or a few quarters but um um yeah i i'm just very excited for that so uh that being said i firat i appreciate that you think that i have the the power and the influence <laughs> to pump SoFi. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Sorry. I'm in it with you, pal. It is, it is what it is. I, I, I don't even know what it's doing today. Is it, is it down to like 12? Probably. I'm not even watching. That's my advice. Also, don't... real quick before we get to, to Garrett Sala from the money stocks. Yeah. I, I, we've been saying this. I've, I've heard this being thrown around since May of 2020. So to give some context, right? COVID hits late February. Market crashes sure. in March. Uh the stock market v-shaped recovery in may sure. of 2020 so two months after the recovery i heard people saying oh is, is this the top right like people are retail trade you know whatever sharon our sharon just messaged me about sharon from benzinga who's who is she's our hr person she's amazing we she, love sharon she just messaged me uh about opening a robin hood account is get this, her on the show is this the top let's get her on the show <laughs> sharon we are getting you on this show, this wh- wh- whether you want it or not. <laughs> Sharon Benzinga's HR person just asked for AB to open up a Robin Hood account. All right, enough of me bloviating. I've got on some tangents today, but let's we, l- let's bring Gareth Soloway on. From and the while he side. does that, I'm going to reach out to Sharon and see if we can get her on the show. All right. Gareth, how we doing, my man? Hey, I'm doing well. You guys are cracking me up over there, outing Sharon like that. 
<laughs> we try. No, I mean, sh look, I mean, it's it's like my, my I, I was joking with Spencer like, a few months ago. My mom was texting me about like opening a brokerage account, and she's like, "Which one should I do?" And for some reason, I don't know what I was thinking that day, but I had her open an interactive <laughs> brokers account instead what? of just like a what? <laughs> instead of just like a fidelity or something and like she still has it and uses it and i'm like yeah that probably wasn't the the best choice for you considering you're not like <laughs> mom oh, it's dude. all about the fees and the spreads and the, 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 yeah the, the, i don't know that was stupid <laughs> I, I that was stupid but uh, you know it is what it is whatever how's it going man well what are you trading today hey um i Going well, and uh, and thank you guys for having me on. Uh, great to be here. So, so a couple of things I'd love to show. You guys just talked about SoFi, right? So, if I can show my chart here, I'd love to show this. Yeah. Take a look at this level. It's actually a good buying opportunity. Um, right. I mean, this chart just looks like so symmetrical. You doesn't right? it though? Yeah. It's a nice when charts work out like that, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Basically, this this should be major support right around twelve bucks. So I'll probably be a buyer right around there. So I think this is one that's on my radar. And I've actually been, you know, generally accumulating some of these beaten down names. You know, I'm looking for names that have been overly demolished. So, for instance, Square is one that I'm I'm been accumulating a little bit down here. You can see it's fallen almost directly from two hundred and seventy dollars down to about one thirty two. Uh, so I've been buying a little bit of that. And again, what I'm doing is I'm starting really small so I can add if it goes lower because we are in a market that is in major trouble here. In fact, let me show the S&P 500, the spiders. Take a look at that channel, right? So you have this beautiful channel. And then if you zoom into today's price action, look at that right there. It's actually breaking below. So, so that's not a good sign for the overall market. So definitely going a little bit lighter on share size. But some of the other ones I've been accumulating, AI, ridiculously beaten down, you know, was $180 stock now $27. Um, when we talked about square, uh, Peloton, Peton, another one that's just been annihilated. So, so I think again, for me, it's, it's about swing trading, right? So I'm not looking to, to hold these for 20 years or 10 years, or even one year. I'm saying to myself, these are overbought stochastics have now definitely gone to the negative side to where they're way oversold. The charts are into key supports. So it's now time to start to accumulate a little bit. And you can see right, right here on Peloton, right? If you look back on the chart, see all this choppy sideways action before the big run up and then just take a trend line right there and just stretch it over. And you're basically right into that level there. I mean, we're at like the IPO, the opening price of Peloton, yeah. aren't we? You could have bought this at the at the, at the the open of the IPO and are, been are, sitting on profits for a year and a half or for... Wait, are we really at the, the opening price? I mean, we're I basically really... at 2019 levels here. Let me Let me zoom back out a little bit and see... If if that is the case, yeah, I mean you you're basically there. You're just about there. It looks like around twenty seven dollars when it debuted right over here in two thousand nineteen. Which is, I mean, think about that. You, you know, you're telling me that even with things reopening, Peloton hasn't made some sort of you know good progress in in developing their business. I don't know. So to me, these are the types of things I look for. I look for these disparities in charts that just don't make sense in this environment. Well, on the Peloton note, it, it's not a, it's not on the chart at all. But did you see the 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 news from I guess it was today that there uh, there's two headlines. One of them I think came over the weekend that they're they're raising they're adding some fees, mm -hmm. um, just in, in an effort to increase costs. And then CNBC had a a scoop a couple hours ago that they've hired McKinsey to review their cost structure. Oh my God. Which is basically akin to like, like yeah, we're, we, who can we fire? <laughs> basically, yeah. who, can, who can we fire? So, <laughs> um, the market may that. actually like that. I mean, if they do a little trend, oh, I mean, I'm sure the market loves McKinsey coming in. I don't they, think from a, they, they do love it. They I don't do think from it. like a, a human standpoint, it's yeah. always a great thing, no. but yeah. wait, so, so Gareth, I'm all, I'm all for, for, trying to find some beaten down stocks that are at some great opportunities, but I'm not buying Peloton here. No, no. <laughs> See, you're not, you're not saying, Oh, I could have had this at this price in 2019 at the IPO. I'll take a shot. <laughs> well, Peloton was one of those stocks, uh, one of those COVID stocks that ran that actually kind of made sense, right? People can't go to their gyms anymore. They can, you know, they're going to they pay $40 a month or whatever the subscription is to, mm -hmm. to have the Peloton. But I think there have just been a lot of indicators over the past year or so that show that, uh, I mean, look, they lower the price. You, know, you don't lower the price of your base model if it's flying off the shelves. You, you, lower, sure. the, uh, you lower the price of your, your base model if you're having trouble selling. They had way more inventory than they had planned 
when, mind you, everyone had no inventory because of the supply chain issues. Um, I, I just think from a fundamental from a fundamental standpoint, uh, if I can pay fifty dollars a month to have a Peloton in my house, or pay fifty dollars a month to have a gym membership where I have, uh, you know, twenty stationary bikes among a thousand other things I could do, the, the the choice is obvious. But I'm not saying there's not good value here. I'm just personally not in on this stock. Yeah, no, and that's and that's the beauty of it, right? You need buyers and sellers, and and on the sidelines individuals. So that's yeah, that's totally understandable, and it's definitely risky, right? I mean, there's no doubt about it that it could go to 25 or even 20 before it gets a bounce. And so I'm taking that little bit of risk here. And again, for me, it's spreading. You know, if you have an X amount of dollars, it's putting a little here, a little on, on these other names that I've mentioned, and then looking for that technical bounce that should come in at these key support lines. Yeah. And again, I mean, uh, there's a million different ways to trade out there, too. So if you're looking, mm -hmm. you know, just at the technicals, I, I, I'm not even maybe it, it, it could be a great trade right now. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying from a long term perspective, I'm not really a buyer here. Um, oh, no, neither what, me. Neither me. Don't get me wrong. You know, if, if I got 10 percent out of this tomorrow, I'd be out in a flash. <laughs> Oh, okay, beautiful. So you're looking at that more of just a short term bounce. Yeah, swing trade. So holding it for 10, maybe 15%, and then just bouncing out. So, you know, looking at how oversold it is, and you get that kind of reflex snapback. Right. Um, what do we got? We got Bitcoin pulled up now? Yeah, I just popped up Bitcoin, Bitcoin down a little. I'll tell you one. So overall, um, Bitcoin is definitely under a little bit of pressure today. But I will say one positive about Bitcoin is that if you look at previous big down days in the in the equity markets, right, and we're down 2% on the NASDAQ and 2 on the S&P, you know, Bitcoin previous days has been selling off a lot more than it is today. It's actually holding up really well for the bloodbath in the equity market. So I don't know if that's a little bit of a signal on the charts here. One thing I will show you guys, which is why it bounced at 40,000. Let me show you this. It's such a cool chart. Is that if you take this from the beginning of that big move up in 2020 into 2021, and you stretch a trend line through this low right here and just extend it out, it basically gives you exactly where we are right now, right? So we are at support and you also have this level right here at support as well. So there is a reason why Bitcoin's trying to hold this 40,000 level. The question is how long, if the markets, if the equity markets keep going down, how long can it hold it? Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I think we're, it's just like you said, we're just at this incredibly important level right now where if we break below that 40,000, uh, could be under some pressure. If we bounce yep. off here, then we'll, we'll continue on that upward trend line. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So, uh, so yeah, man, it's been, it's been fun trading. I mean, the volatility for those of you guys out there and, and that, that are more swing traders and day traders, it's been great price action. Uh, big fan of, of this type of action, even though it's obviously not the bull market, you know, that we're all used to, but, um, but yeah, it certainly is fun. So are you trading Bitcoin kind of the same way just as a swing trade or are you a long-term investor? What, what, what's your uh, like trading strategy with Bitcoin? Yeah, with Bitcoin swing trade right now. So so I do I, I, I did enter just around the 40,000 level just for a quick little move. I think it'll get up to 46,000. I might be wrong. But again, you know, that's kind of my short term target. So that would be, you know, 5, 10, 15 percent ish area of return. And then I do think it's going to go lower after that and might most likely actually ultimately get down to 20 sub 20,000 when all is said and done. But there'll be lots of trades for quick traders along the way. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, if you just look at the equity markets, you know, and there's there's obviously a connection, right? We, we see the connection, how deleveraging in the equity markets affects Bitcoin. Bitcoin's down 30 plus percent off the highs, right? And, and the equity markets are only down 10 percent. So what if the equity markets drop another 10 percent? What does that mean for Bitcoin? You know how much lower does it go and uh you know i, I ultimately think you got to have that dot-com flush out in the cryptocurrencies yeah i was actually i saw uh a couple different interesting uh reports over the weekend i think ubs put, put like a warning out to investors saying yeah. that uh you know a crypto winter could be coming and, and someone else said that they see a lot of similarities in the in the crypto market as the run-up to the uh, stock market in the, in the equities market in 19, 1929, like right ahead of the Great Depression. So I don't know. It seems like a lot of these uh, big banks and it, oh, it was Invesco. Invesco said uh, the firm said that the crypto run up reminds experts of the 1929 stock market crash. I saw that. I don't know. I mean, it, seems, it sounds like they're just trying to get uh, get ahead of if there is a, a big crash, they can say, hey, look, we, uh, you yeah. know, we called it. I mean, it always bugs me with analysts, right? I mean, you know, you get these analysts to upgrade stocks when they're at all time highs and then the downgrades, they don't like, like on Bitcoin. I mean, if you know, I'll give them some respect. Like I came out 
six months ago and I was saying, hey, listen, I think Bitcoin is going to drop. And it was, you know, trading near that 65,000 level in, in October. Um, you know, that's the time to downgrade it and say, watch out. You know, now it's down 30 plus percent. And now you're like, oh, well, it's, you know, we could be in a bear market. It's like, well, duh, you know, um, you know, that's the way analysts work. They, they never kind of want to be the first one to call something and they kind of wait for price action to confirm. Um, you know, it is what it is, I suppose. No, that's yep. why the first the first one in or the first one out is always so notable. You know what I mean? Because yeah. it takes it takes guts to it takes guts to make a call before an earnings report. You know that it that does. takes guts. Yeah, if right or wrong, you can't argue with the fact that it takes guts. So. Yeah, yeah, and you're either gonna have egg on your face or look like a genius. So it's one or the other. But but yeah, exactly. I agree. I give credit to people that make the calls ahead of time when when things are you know at their stretched point most point. Yep. Um, what are you guys, what are you guys hearing in terms of, of chatter about cryptocurrencies? Are people starting to get scared? You know, one of the things I watch for is, is a psychological indicator. And I do, I do sense one of the reasons why I'm a little micro bullish on Bitcoin near term is that I definitely feel there's fear out there in crypto now, and it might be due for a technical bounce to kind of take away that fear. Yeah, I think, uh, I'm just looking at a fear greed index right now on crypto or for Bitcoin, and it says we're we're at 24 in, in extreme fear uh, territory. So, I I, I I don't know if extreme fear. I don't know. If well, I'm that's gonna... just what this website's telling me, Spencer. Wait, 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 what is that? What? It's a fear greed index. Wait, is is that for crypto? Yeah, it's for. You see that little Bitcoin? Logo yeah, they have right that there? now for multifactorial crypto market sentiment analysis. Last updated. Extreme fear? Come on! Have you not seen like Twitter? People are freaking out. Because they're not used to this. Even even though it's like not crashing, people just aren't used to it not going up like 3% a day. So it, it, it's uh, oh it's tough. Gosh. I don't know. Did, I mean, guys, <laughs> did you guys see AMC today? I just did a double check take when I saw that thing today. I mean, that's down about 10%, right? Yeah, not only oh, that. Oh, now it's down I mean, to 12. Uh, it's down, $12? It's dollars? No, no, sorry. I meant it was down to 12% and oh. it popped back. <laughs> I was sorry, say. I, I did not mean it went to 12. No. Holy cow. It will be. Yeah, Never mind. I mean, I mean, this is something I still remember so vividly, the Reddit crowd just continuing to say it was going to keep going up. And and it was one of those things where it's just like, you got to take some off the table. And I hope people did. You know, it's one thing to hold a little bit and just hope for something. But but I mean, this is just, you know, you're basically going back to my guess is you'll have major support. And I actually let me get rid of those lines. I actually might be a quick swing trade buyer. Now, I wouldn't buy it for the long term, but there's a lot of support right in here. You know, right at what around. level is that? That looks like it's right below fifteen, right around fourteen dollars. All right. So still a lot of ways, a lot of downside to go. But if it got down there on a straight shot, I think you get. It does look like if you go to like a fifteen-minute chart or something, it does look like we got a little bounce once we got down to eighteen dollars. Look at the fifteen here. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Getting a little bit of an uptick. Is the market upticking too? Let me just take. Yeah, uh, spider uh, getting a little bit of a bounce too in the last thirty minutes. Oh, uh, really? So. So can we can we go to a daily on the uh, on the spy real quick and just I, I'm just curious about a bit of a I want to compare yeah I want to compare uh, the spy chart oh did we break that bottom uh, trend line that it, bottom it's channel in the process yeah you can see right there oh no yeah wait that's not good wait, wait not no good. wait just a minute though because. Can we adjust the line a little bit? Well, no, 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 you know, in all seriousness. This there we is go. The problem. We're okay now, guys. Don't worry. Right, it's okay. Okay. No, 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 okay. no. In all seriousness, this is the problem that I have sometimes now like with, with, with these channels is like I saw a bunch of channels that were they, – they drew them the other week. And what was it? Two Mondays ago, we had that big down day, but we closed green. That big that, – that, that island candle that's all by itself two weeks ago. That candle was like – clearly the one that broke the trend and yet here i mean i don't know i just i, I find trend lines to be so they so now did, but did it close so so one of the keys is to remember is that you know if something pierces a line that doesn't really mean a whole lot because it could be a fake out by the institutions or whatever it is but you want really want to see does it close at the end of the day below that line i don't know if that one did on the chart you're talking I don't about know either i don't know but listen, I mean, you know, one of the things about trend lines and even technical analysis is it's it's part science and then part part like art, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there is a matter, you know, people will draw different trend lines, and and the question is is which one is ultimately the exact one, and you can only do the best you can do. Um, you know, that's that's really all you can do when you do it. I do it as accurately as I think it is, um, but again, there's no guarantees, right? 
Can we uh, just compare real quick this chart to the cues, maybe to see if we see like any more? I, I know they're probably gonna be pretty similar, but if maybe there's a little bit more weakness or a little bit more strength in, in one versus the other. Yeah, it looks like at least we'll go into the cues here. It does look like so here it was below. They saved it, and now it looks like two days ago it closed below. Then it got back above, and now it's starting to trade back down. But but in terms of the cues, right? The cues percentage wise are f much further down versus the S and P. Par partially, I think, because the tech stocks are getting beaten up because of uh, interest rates at 1.85 or wherever they are now. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. So where where I mean, would you just be kind of I, I guess like really bearish if we break a, a certain level, or is it more just if this kind of weakness continues, or, or, or how's your outlook? outlook for just the overall equities market over the next i don't know three to six months yeah so i mean for me you know i'm definitely i'm actually looking at the equity markets and bitcoin being underperformers compared to gold and the metals this year so that just tells you all you need to know when you start favoring gold and the metals over over markets and, and bitcoin but yeah for me it's, it's a big deal to see this trend break i mean if you think about the trend this is this is marking a trend right all the way up for the last year and a half uh, almost two years, in fact. And if it's actually breaking, that's not good for the market. So I'm actually, I actually think that there's, there's an outside chance that we could actually head all the way back here on the spiders by year end. Um, and the reason I'm getting that is because if, if you think about what the Federal Reserve did by pumping so much money in from COVID, from the beginning of COVID of March 2020, and now they're really taking it away, then it almost makes sense that this run up was due to money printing. And if they're taking it away, why wouldn't the markets retrace to your pre-COVID high right there? I, you know, again, that's a big drop. I, you know, that would be a massive drop if that happened, that but it is a possibility. I think. The other side of that coin, though, Gareth, is that the, uh, in addition to the Fed printing money, earning corporate earnings are also at an all-time high, right? Sure. GDP is at an all-time high. You in the U.S., right? So that. That's the other. That's the fundamental thesis. That's yeah. the anti-conspiracy thesis. But the the question I would have in that respect is like, is that did the market already factor that in? And and now we're coming into this period where you know with less Fed stimulus, the economy and, and higher interest rates, right? That's that generally will slow the economy down. Does that then hurt future earnings, which is what stocks are pricing in? And then stocks start to say, okay, well you know, there won't be record earnings in the next six months or 12 months, and we have to adjust stock prices back down. I don't know, you know, it's all about how the market wants to price it in. But, um, but you could arguably say that the easy money policy is what helped the economy be sure. as strong as it was. And sure. if they are taking sure. that away, it's kind of like, I always say it's like a drug dealer, right? The drug dealer has been the Fed just pumping the drugs into the market. And now if they're actually taking it away, does the patient start to convulse or, you know, go into withdrawal? Sure. sure. But, um, I just had a thought. Oh yeah, I, I wanted to pull up a chart of Exxon Mobil, uh, which is your proxy for energy. Which even though energy, Wait, actually, don't they have XLE? Yeah, but Exxon Mobil is the largest of them. So okay. I just decided to pull this up. So Exxon Mobil is in the green today. XLE is flat, which means it's up on a day where the whole market is down. Mm -hmm. um, and so Goldman put out a note. The, today, yesterday, they called for hundred hundred dollar barrel oil. I don't know. Um, you know, I didn't see a timeline on that. I'm sure maybe by the end of the year. I don't know, but uh, that would be uh, quite a turnaround. What do you think of the uh, of energy of oil here, Gareth? I mean, Exxon Mobil. Has yeah. Been so, so I am short. I am short oil right now. And and honestly, I didn't look at the longer term on this. I don't know if you guys can flip to my chart, but I love to show this trend line that I just discovered. It's one of the coolest things ever. So check this out. And, and I just literally brought this up when you were talking about it. But, you know, you see the it's Exxon's had a big run. It's back to 7250. But what if you were to take this high all the way over here and just connect all these highs? Look at that. Right into where we currently are. So to me, that would actually tell me that. I mean, I honestly might even think about after this going and shorting a little Exxon Mobil or maybe buying a few puts to try to see if there is a pullback off this trend line. Um, remember, if you look at the WTI chart, and let me pop that up here. Um, I think WTI hit double top today. Let me bring up that short term anyways, double top. So yeah, you have a little double top right from here as well. So, so oil should be into resistance. I mean, it's been an amazing run on oil, but it wouldn't shock me to see at least a pullback in the next you know few days to a week or two off of this double top. And the Exxon trend line is a great one. 
All right. Uh, yeah, it's funny because energy has been just such a dog for so long, and yet here we are. It's uh, it's uh, yeah. It's, I mean, I'm all, I've always been long. someone who like sells into strength, right? So, so when right. I see something ripping, I'm I'm usually not someone that's going to jump in at that point. If anything, I'm going to look the opposite way to pull back, just because I don't I don't like being a chaser. I want to be like first in. So like shorting here on oil would be your double top. And there's a technical reason there to pull the trigger. Same thing with Exxon at that level. And then again, just to keep it clear for everyone watching, you know, I'm not looking to hold Exxon for a year on the short side. It would be in and out for 10%, you know, kind of a quick 10% hit. I mean, what they, crude oil is at like six year highs right now or something. Yeah, it's like? ridiculous. So uh, yeah, I mean, you, you can safely assume that all these oil stocks, as soon as, because the price of oil is going to keep going up, until it doesn't, right? And it'll come back down. Um, hey, it, yeah, I was agreeing with you. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, assuming OPEC <laughs> or, you know, whoever wants to produce more oil. But right. uh, then you can safely assume that Exxon and these other oil stocks will, will move lower off those highs. That's not to say that they can't still have great years and, and be bullish long term. But in the short term, uh, as soon as that price of crude oil drops, which uh, could be any day, could be months from now, who knows? Uh, yeah, I think these stocks will set up for for a quick short. Yeah, yeah, and that's it again. That's that's kind of what I'm looking for. My time horizon for my investments is usually like one week to one month kind of thing. Uh, got it, Gareth Salloway. Any 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 final thoughts for us, Gareth? As we are sort of wrapping up wrapping up the show here, guy. Yeah. Guy, guy, one, I appreciate it. I mean, I think I think investors should just be ready for a much more volatile year. I think the Fed always printing money previously in the last year has put a market, you know, it always made it where a 3% drawdown was a buying opportunity. I would start getting ready for more and more of these 2%, 1.5% moves on the markets, uh, almost normalized basis. And it's a great trading market, a great swing trading market, but definitely be a little bit careful if you look at the longer term moves of the markets even going back years i mean we have not look at look at how sharp of a move up this was even compared to the previous yeah. you know seven years so again if you just think about reversion reversion to the mean it does tell you that i mean you could easily head back here's a beautiful trend line marking off these tops a reversion to the mean would take you at least down here on the s p 500 so just be ready for volatility everyone exactly right be ready for i've been saying this pretty, pretty much i i Made in my mind a week ago. Be ready for his yo-yo, zigzag, pogo stick, whatever you want to call it. Some volatility, baby. Yeah. Uh, you, you can also call it that. Back and forth action, <laughs> sideways action, trade the range, channels, whatever. Insert exactly. adjective here. Gareth Soloway, Twitter handle up on the screen. Gareth, a pleasure as always. Have a good one. Hey, thank you guys. All right. Uh, it is 1.57. We're going to wrap up this show. we got like two minutes left. There is no roadmap today. I guess technically we could go late, but we're not going to. Uh, no roadmap this week, actually, because Chris Cacci is taking some well-deserved time off. Everyone needs a break every now and then. So Chris is off for the week. Therefore, no roadmap. We'll be back next week. Um, I just want to make a, a quick note because I feel like... What do you got? I feel like interest rates out there are, are getting a bad rap. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Okay. So it, it, we know interest rates are rising this year, and we know when we when they do. We, we've talked about this before. Spencer's said it before. The market doesn't like not knowing things. We know we're getting interest rates. We just don't know exactly when and how much. Um, but in the short term, yes, gr it, rising interest rates, bad uh, for, for stocks, bad for equities, especially growth stocks. And it, it, it just makes logical sense, right? Because if a stock is projecting 20% return over five years, say, but then interest rates go to 2%, then that 20% becomes 18% and it's not as attractive. Um, but with that said, interest rates um, are a sign. You want a, a little bit of interest rates as a sign of a good strong growing economy right zero percent or negative interest rates are not the sign uh, of a good strong self-sustaining economy um so i just want to keep throw that out there that just because we have rising interest rates does not mean that we're not going to be in a good spot in terms of the overall economy 
I, I agree with you. The economy is doing okay, right? Yeah. More or less. Right. Basically, Again. all I'm saying is I say I think look for these moves in the short term, not the long term. Like, don't think, oh, my God, I have to go out and sell all my tech stocks because interest rates are rising. No, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, they're all still going to make a bunch of money uh, with the rising interest rates and probably still be great stocks. But definitely in the short term, uh, they have already gotten hit and will potentially continue to get hit. Um, but again, long term interest rates, no big deal. It's just a reframing. The market just needs time to digest to the. Uh, get you need to see the valuations to get back down to earth. Because if you val, if everything is valued at zero percent interest rates, which is what we've had over the past eighteen yeah. months, yeah. and then now right. we're rising, and they need just need to get revalued. So that's all that's happening right now. Um, but I, I do like the idea of having a little bit more volatility. It means it's fun for us. It's fun so, for options. So, yeah, yeah. Fun for options. All right. That's a wrap. How many likes do we have today? Is uh, talk to me, Goose. You can email him, uh, Jason Goose. at Benzinga.com. He, who, where in the, we, we should make that segment. Where in the world is Raz? I have no idea. Could be in, you're the one that talks to him. The could most. be in Florida. Well, last, yeah, he was in Florida last time I talked to him. Uh, actually, funny story, but I'll tell you off the air. Well, save it for tomorrow. How about that? Everyone hit that like button, please. Thanks to all of our guests today. Thanks to Gareth. Thanks to Lauren. Um, thanks to um, um, David Green. Thanks to Matt. I'm trying to remember who all the guests we had on the show today. Uh, Lauren Simmons, Gareth Oh, I forgot about Catherine. Thanks Matt. to Catherine Shen from Miss Fresh. <laughs> Matt, Lauren Simmons. Gareth Soloway, David Green. Thanks to all of you in the chat for hanging out. We're going to take a uh, potentially an hour-long break, but we'll be back on that to close. I've got Mitch with me today, um, and uh, I'll see you guys oh, over I there. So, so Joel's not around? Joel's on vacation as well. I don't know, everyone so decided. Mitch got the invite, but not me. Okay, I see how it is. Want to do the show with me? You can no, do the show. no, it's fine. That wasn't the first choice, and I don't want to do it. Hit that like, everyone. Thanks for hanging out with us. We'll catch you later. Let's end this show and and go trade some some yellow call options on Activision. <laughs>